Welcome to the Killer Frogs, the podcast all about TCU athletics from the fans' point of view. My name is Sean Fouché, and this is Season 4, Episode 11 for November 7th, 2017. And yes, this is the actual Episode 11. Last week was uh, Episode 10. In fact, this is Episode 11, Take 2. And uh, joining me on tonight's panel are Killer Frog Emeritus Wes Phelan. Wes, how you doing? I'm a happy man, Sean. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. Uh, also with us, TCU Hall of Famer WC Nix. Hey, Dubber. Hey. Hope everybody's doing great, because I am. Great day, <laughs> great day. And recruiting expert Hunter Nix. <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, we're doing pretty good. And uh, the boss, Ryan Zeller, is back at home and no longer telecommuting from DFW Airport. Hey, that Ryan. is Oh, hey, y'all. Um, long time no see. <laughs> so, um, I am glad to be back. Last week was frustrating because of technical difficulties, so I missed getting to talk to all y'all and glad to be back this week. I was, I'm going to tell everybody that definitely make um, Iowa State one of your away games. Um, if you travel just to one away game, schedule that one for um, not next year, but um, the year after that because those Fans are super nice. It's just a, it's a really, really fun trip. And, I, and and when you can say that, when you have lost, when you're undefeated and then you lose, and you can still say it was a fun trip, that that tells you something right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to love those games in the Midwest. They know how to treat people right. And uh, also joining us, special guest tonight, women's head basketball coach, Reagan Peebley. Coach, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, we appreciate you joining us. And a uh, quick pro- programming note, you may hear some things that we uh, may allude to throughout this entire episode. Unfortunately, about halfway through the recording, I realized our recording had stopped. So this is take two tonight for episode 11. And uh, we're just going to jump straight in because coach's time is important. We're going to talk a little bit about women's basketball. And uh, we were discussing before the, the whole kind of mix up with the recording. I'll take full blame for that. Uh, we were talking about the um, athletic nutrition program that you guys have at TCU, Coach, and uh, you were trying to explain to us a little bit about how there's some new studies that are coming out with, um, I guess, 60 Minutes had one about Oklahoma State and just how uh, Chris Del Conte's kind of listened to you guys and, and you guys have implemented a new nutritional program there at TCU. Well, yeah, and again, I think, uh, you know, there's the obvious, everybody's looking for a little bit of an edge. And um, with technology these days, um, everyone is looking for just the most minute edge that you can find. And nutrition is one of those. Sleep is huge part of, uh, you know, providing your student athletes with, um, you know, just the opportunity to be at their best. And they're, they're learning. It's not just about the hours that you practice. It's about the time that you spend off the court. And uh, sleep is one of those things that help you get an edge. Nutrition and how you fuel your body is. Um, And, you know, hydration is a a gigantic, huge thing. But what I think has been really special about how we've had this um, training table for the last year and a half, really, is how the student athletes have been able to interact and come together and continue to support each other in their grinds and their work and their uh, pursuit of championships and Speaking of championships, we can't not talk for a second. I'm sure you guys will get to it later, but soccer, women's soccer, and what they did today, they were so dang close, and we were cheering for them so loud. Um, But we're incredibly proud of Eric Bell and the women of TCU soccer. Yeah, and here, during here. our first take, we, we we went over this, but yeah, it was that was a heartbreaking loss to uh, women's soccer drop to Baylor in the Big Twelve championship game uh, this uh, this evening. And uh, for those of you who didn't get a chance to watch, it was on FS1. I'm sure there's going to be a replay later in the week. But uh, women lose in overtime, uh, two to one to Baylor, and overtime something that this soccer team has uh, had to endure several times over the last week, and they um, they're now kind of uh, stuck waiting on the committees. Uh, decision on whether or not they're going to make it to the NCAA tournament. And for those Frog fans who don't quite understand how the, the soccer rules go, they're kind of like baseball where they have a an RPI and a committee that determines, and they're right on the bubbles. So, But like you were mentioning beforehand, Coach, I think you said that you know, their RPI is pretty high, and they've, they've made really good showings here in the last couple of weeks, so maybe that's enough to push them over the edge. I think so. You know, and again, I, I, I'm more of a basketball mind, not a soccer, but, uh, I mean, their RPI is so good right now and they've taken a team into overtime in the championship game. You are seconds away essentially from 
being the champions. And um, I just, again, Eric Bell's got great momentum with this team. And uh, I, I'm, I don't know a lot, a lot, and this is not for many sure source, but I'm going to say they're in, they're going to go dance. Yay. From your lips. I hope so. Cause yeah, I, I, they deserve it. I think another note, uh, the team they lost to today was Baylor, and they beat them last Friday. It's really hard to double dip a team like that uh, in a close period of time, but that just shows they're very capable and they're they're a really good team. So hopefully they make it in. Yeah, and this was the Baylor second overtime game to Baylor too. We beat them the yeah, first exactly. time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So Baylor's a pretty good team in, in women's soccer. Well, they were the fifth seed going into this tournament. Um, but they're but they were they're a team that kind of caught lightning in the bottle towards the end of the season. So I mean they they're they're a really good team and they've got some really good players. Uh, but you know our our women's soccer team is also really good and got some really good players. And I I would really hate to see that this is the last game for the seniors. I hopefully they make it into the tournament. Yeah, here here, that'd be great. Yeah, because we've never done that before. Wait, well, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I mean well, that's, yeah, and it's just kind of like what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks about the culture. Of uh, yeah. of TCU athletics and coach, you could certainly talk to this. I mean, the from from when you came in to TCU to where we are now, it, it, we've been kind of on this uphill trajectory as far as like this winning tradition and this winning culture with all of TCU athletics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's an adjustment period that each program, depending on where they were at when they came into the Big Twelve, has to go through. And um, but you know, it's winning's contagious. And again, the more that um, teams win and the more these athletes interact with each other and the coaches, the chemistry that our coaching staffs have with one another and our administration is phenomenal. Uh, But there is a a tremendous upswing to what TCU is doing. And, And look, it's not just our athletic department, it's our whole institution, you know, from our med school and what our business school is doing um, there's so many great things happening on this campus here in Fort Worth. It really is. Yeah. And like you were talking about earlier with the dining table, I mean, there, here's an opportunity for the, for the athletes to con- congregate together and, and, and do business together. But also, you know, it, it's a way for, for community to kind of come together in community. And it's, uh, it's, it's a fantastic way that, that instead of segregating everybody away from each other, you know, each sports kind of does their own little thing. You guys are like a family. We are. And I think one of the ways, this is may not seem so obvious to everyone else, but when we have recruits that come out to our campus and visit and tour, one of the things that they love that they notice is different from our school to another school is that just the geography of our campus and the footprint and how all of the athletics is essentially right there together. And I know we have baseball and soccer and track a little bit off, but they train, they lift, they eat, they study right there with the rest of the student athletes. And you can go from the academic center all the way into the coaches, basketball coaches offices in our practice gym and be indoor the whole entire time. (laughs) And you're going to run into Chris Del Conte, the student athletes. You're going to run into other coaches. You know, I see the volleyball players. I see the baseball players and are able to, connect with them and and they also with our players so there is a true connection and community that happens within our our horn frog student athletes and that's and, and that's just what is fantastic and it's something and i know hunters mentioned this before too with the recruits is that they they tend to kind of really focus on that that sense of family that that we've built here at tcu you cut out a little bit sorry i didn't hear Sorry, no. I was saying, hunters. Hunters mentioned that before too, where where the recruits have made a mention that it's it's kind of the sense of family that kind of draws them in to TCU. There is, there is, and we're able to talk about that with the student athletes and the coaches. But also, when you have class sizes, thirteen students to one professor, and you've got professors that are going their going out of their way to make sure every student in the classroom actually is not just getting a degree, but getting an education and getting internships and getting experiences that are going to, and networking them that help propel them beyond their four years at TCU. Like those stories are priceless and they do help tremendously in the recruiting process. Well, talk to us about basketball recruiting. Is there any, anything you can uh, divulge a little bit as far as women's basketball? 
Well, we uh, have signing coming up this next week. We're really excited about that. We're going to sign four um, young women, and uh, we added a lot of size um, to this uh, recruiting class with two post players at 6'3 and taller. Um, and then, uh, you know, another area is we really felt like we needed to sign um, a, a true point guard and combo guard. Um, we're really excited about this group. And you guys know the rules. You've heard it from all of us coaches. We can't really say names and too many specifics <laughs> until that signing date comes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, just incredibly um, excited about this group. And, you know, look, we have one true freshman this year compared to the seven that we had last year. And um, so four is going to feel kind of like no, it'll feel like normal after three years that we'll have four freshmen next year instead of the, the polar opposites of one and seven the last two years. Hmm. And the signing day is this week, Coach? Or yes. Next week? Um, and I think I'm right. I might be wrong, but. We now have football has the new early signing period. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, so is. we've got football and men's basketball and women's basketball and, and perhaps a couple other sports um, with that early signing period. And so I think it's going to be kind of a, a huge thing and a huge event now um, in that second week of November um, from here on out for all of TCU. Yeah. Hunter, when, when is the football early signing? Uh, I think football. Football's early sign is in December. Okay. Is it yeah. December 20th? okay. Yeah. So they have the early signing in December, and then the next one is in uh, is in February, okay. uh, the old signing date. So it's yeah, a little so bit later, but it's not not too far off now. Six yeah. weeks of just nonstop fun as recruiting far as recruiting. News. Yes. Yeah. And I know you guys love all that stuff. We do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's coach, amazing how many people bit, follow that. Can you talk a little bit about the process when you've got them? Um, you know. You, I guess the girls can start faxing in their letters of intent at eight o'clock that morning on signing day. Is that correct? Well, well, Wes, Wes, you and I are both like showing our age right now when we talk about faxing because they don't fax anymore. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't like tell me they tweet. A screenshot of their NLI and they text it to us. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, uh, they yes. So they we are allowed to send them their NLI. We got those out to them um, just uh, this past week. And a lot of the kids now do a big event at their school. Yeah. And they'll um, do it on that first day of the signing week. There's five days in the signing period. Um, and uh, once that's signed, they usually email it right back to us or screenshot it. They can take a picture of it and send it to us. And then we send it to our compliance. And then from there, it goes to the Big 12 office where they certify it. And once it's certified um, and 24 hours passes, that's when we as an institution can really comment. And now they're no longer a prospect. They okay. are, are – they're a TCU yeah. Horn Frog. And, uh, okay, that's what I wanted to – start to change. That's what I wanted people to hear because there's a lot of people just say, how come they haven't announced anything? I've said for years it's got to be – well, I'm, I've said facts, Jim, but as you said, you can take yeah. a, a sure. screenshot of it or whatever – but send it in. It's got to go to compliance. It's got to go to NCAA and then back to you guys. And then, and only then, you can uh, you can release it. So that's yeah, right. There are some people who don't understand the process, and I wanted the people to hear it from the coach's lips herself. Yeah. So you know, well, how this, the rules keep how this process works. The rules keep changing to try and keep up with what social media is doing across the country in that generation. But we are allowed um, if a student athlete or if a prospect puts it out that they've committed or that they've signed their letter of intent. We are allowed to do pretty much anything with social media that requires one touch. So we can like, okay. we can retweet, we can favor it. We can do that, but we couldn't con create or construct our own tweet that right. says, right. Hey, we just got this NLI in from this person. It's not certified yet, but hooray. Um, but we can, we can, we can retweet whatever they tweet. Gotcha. Um, is I is that actually part of in the rules, Coach? Is that they actually say Where? you could like oh, example? Yeah. You can retweet. Is that like yeah, one of the? It's, it's yep. Wow. There there's some crazy ones out there, but um, that's you can do some. You can pretty much do anything that requires one touch. Huh. Hmm. Like you know, that. my fax machine just takes one button and one touch, and I. Can... <laughs> <laughs> It's in a museum. I, when was the last time you got a fax, Wes? 
<laughs> oh God, ten years. I mean, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Hey, you, you guys know, know we've got our first game coming up this Saturday. And you guys know what the halftime show is? No. What, no. what is halftime show? It's Wes on a pummel horse. Is that- <laughs> <laughs> you guys are going to love it. I've got a great routine planned out. It's going to be wonderful. I can't wait. We're going to sell the joint out. You, man. Can, can, he, can he do it holding a snake? Oh, man. How about that? Oh, don't give away my secret. I, that was my big ending. Dad, damn it, Sean. It was at, uh, the, at the dismount with the ball python around you. Is that is that? Oh, I've, I've been working on that for weeks. Yeah. I yeah. can only imagine Wes jumping through the hoop of fire like uh, what's his name in old school, like Will Ferrell in old school. And just, <laughs> yeah. you know. As long as he's wearing the same down. shorts. Exactly. I think that's yeah. got to be like put in. You have to wear that. That's the official uniform. Yeah. <laughs> got to wear those short basketball shorts going. from like the 80s. During, um, Wes's era, though, probably, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. well, you well, know. Joe, uh, Kramer, Joe Kramer and Chet, Chet had uh, issued a challenge to Scott and I once for a beach volleyball match. <laughs> Scott and I against a couple of the beach volleyball players. And we, you know, I thought she was serious at first. I thought, Scott, I'm not getting out there in a big <laughs> it wouldn't be like Top Gun, would it? No. <laughs> Not much is, Ryan. Not much is. <laughs> one, one can dream. Uh, I, 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 there's not enough bleach for my eyes. Oh, come on. You guys, uh. you guys, be, be secure enough in your manhood to be able to say you can, like, really honor what that Ooh. scene is. Getting called out by coach here. Okay. Well, no, no. I tell you, I tell you, I, I would be, I would be far more willing to do a three on three with, with some of your, your, uh, your players than trying to get out there and, and play Iceman as beach volleyball. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm supposed to take that as a compliment or not. <laughs> no, I, I'm just saying you, you don't have to, you're not, the expectations is you're not taking off your shirt when you're, when you're yeah, indoors exactly. playing we don't basketball. Have to see Sean's shirtless. That's no, the no, 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 <laughs> no, no, Hey, Goose wore a tank top. Yeah, well, hey, you know what? There you go. Yeah, but <laughs> Goose can pull off a tank top. <laughs> there you go. And this is taking a weird turn. It did. Always yeah. does. Yeah. Well, no, speaking oh, of that, I, Coach, I, speaking of podcast. speaking of pickup games real quick with, with basketball, I think you had mentioned at one point in time to us that, that you had um, – what was it that you had guys come in uh, to play pickup games against the, the girls' basketball team? We do. We've got, um, we call them our, our frog squad. So they're guys on campus that, um, you know, played, whether it was junior college basketball and maybe they tried to walk on on our men's team and didn't quite make it. Um, we've had some guys that are getting ready to try and walk on on the football team and baseball team come out and uh, just kind of stay in shape working with us. Um, or they played high school ball. And uh, what they do is they just provide that athleticism and speed and strength that we need uh, to go against as we prepare for our opponents. Um, and, and basketball is a game of habits. And I don't want our girls practicing habits that another team has. I want them working on our habits. So that's why we use these guys to come in and, uh, you know, help us get our game plan all ready for our opponents. That's cool. I've never heard of that. That's really neat. Got, probably, I think we've got about 20. Go ahead. Sorry, you were saying, Coach, you have 20 what? Yeah, we've got about 20 guys, 20 students um, wow. that are on this frog squad. And on any given day, we have anywhere between five and seven of them at our practices. Hmm. Oh, Wow. So it, this happens, yeah, daily. That's that's impressive. I was thinking that maybe I'll brought them in maybe once a month, but that sounds like it's a regular part of practice. Oh no, they're <laughs> every day. They're there. They're so important, and they get nothing <laughs> except for some shoes and some gear to do it, which is apparently a pretty big deal uh, for them. Yeah. But oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we've had a few actually get a date or two out of it. I think, but oh. <laughs> other than that, I was going to say, yeah, they yeah, get the swag, but <laughs> then you know they get a date too. I tell you what, that's, that's happened a few times, a few times. But um, <laughs> it's they really do become a part of our program, uh, and we're incredibly grateful for how they serve our team. Well, it just goes again into that whole concept of family. 
That's, Reagan, that's just fantastic. a little about you had um, the ice cream social about a month ago. It was wonderful. You had your athletes there, and they each got up and talked about um, your the summer in Australia playing basketball. And then the new part for me was um, your mentorship that you have set up for them, um, getting to know some professionals in the. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Well, what we try and do is, um, you know, we want TCU, this their experience here to be this, you know, ex this catapult experience for the rest of their lives on and off the floor. And so um, what we do with the Ice Cream Social is it's a great kickoff event where our team gets to, you know, um, or our fans get to meet our team and, and really uh, celebrate that new season of girls. And then we also try and get our girls, our women to meet some of the fans and what we do, we're very intentional. And uh, Ryan, we're so grateful for the way killer frogs was partnered with us in this event. Um, we had the largest attendance at this event that we have in the last three years. And we're going to have to find a new venue for it next year because we were standing room only, but we um, pair our girls up intentionally with um, community members and fans. Uh, and some of those relationships are where it's somebody who is in the field that they want to go into after uh, they graduate. Sometimes it's because of a personal life um, similarity and commonality. Uh, but some really cool things have happened because of those mentorship relationships that we've uh, um, uh, had for our girls in the past. So, so for people listening to this podcast right now, you know, if you're interested in doing something that in the future, you could probably reach out to the basketball office and you know let them know if, if um, there's something that you would enjoy if you would enjoy mentoring one of the future basketball stars of TCU so. yeah it was uh yes please contact us if that's something you want to do and you know we had everybody all the mentors have to go through a little bit of compliance education and just making sure they understand the rules so nobody gets in any kind of trouble uh, but again it's a really really cool thing and i i it's a story for another day, but we've had some lives changed because of those relationships. That's wonderful. I, think it's I, was brought, I was brought to tears a, a few times during that evening yeah. with the girls. It's really pretty special. So that's that's a well. It wasn't all sad and sa sa like sappy. We had some laughs. Oh gosh, we did have some laughs. I wanted, I you know, eventually, um, who, who was her name? The one who raps and rapped it. Oh, Tori. Oh my gosh. I, I wanted to just re to request that. So we may have to have a special podcast with her after season or maybe after she graduates where she comes on. and yeah, she's, That's a really, really cool gift that she has. She's a gospel rapper. She's been able to produce some uh, her own album and she's had a couple music videos and she's gotten some interest from some pretty neat people and uh, she wants to they really locked in on her season right now. Um, but as soon as that season's over, um, she'll graduate. And then uh, who knows what's going to happen for Tori Thompson. That's amazing. Good Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's so programs like that that really do help out. From, from the perspective of the fan, you know, a lot of us, we're just looking at it from the sports perspective. But you guys do so much more for these student athletes than, than a lot of the fans realize. And that's just one of them. And I, I'm, I'm really proud of what this school has done and what all of you guys have done for the program and for the students. Cause it's just been, it's amazing. Like you said, it, it really does transform a lot of these girls lives. It does. Well, and that's what TCU is about, you know, servant leadership and teaching, uh, teaching them how to go lead on and teaching them how to go serve the communities and, uh, and make this a, a better place. And, you know, goodness, we all know we need it and not to bring a somber note to this, but what's happened in San Antonio today and, mm -hmm. Um, you just you need more and more people just to leave this school and go out and truly make a difference and a change. And what athletics does is it provides them a platform to learn those leadership gifts, to try those out, to, you know, see what God's trying to do in their lives and how to use this sport. Um, and truly, you know, a lot of the coaches here at TCU understand that and get that. And that comes from Chancellor Bashini all the way down. Yeah, and our prayers are certainly with the uh, the families of, of everyone who was affected by that tragedy, the, the 
terrible shooting at the uh, Baptist Church outside of San Antonio this uh, this morning. Yeah, and, uh, um, you're right. This world needs more more leaders, more Christian leaders, um, more children of God out there to to profess, you know, the good word. And and you know, if we all if we all did that, it'd be a better place. But what That's you right. guys do and what you're transforming there at TCU and in their lives and and they go out and they transform other lives. It's just it's fantastic. You guys plant the seed and it just grows from there. Absolutely, absolutely. But we got we got a pretty exciting season ahead, you know. And I know um, what's happening here at TCU. And you talk about transform um, with basketball. Obviously, TCU's been known as a football school for a long time in baseball. And um, I love what's happening with TCU and just how Fort Worth's really wrapping their arms around um, our program. And you know, definitely Jamie and the men's program. Um, we want this place just as soon as that, as soon as football's over, um, even while the two seasons collide, we want this place just bursting with joy, and we want that Shulmire Arena just rocking. Um, the Frog Army, what the students are doing, I think that's going to be really exciting this season. And uh, you know, the the Killer Frogs, we need you guys out there in full force. I know there's a lot of you out there. Um, <laughs> But we're going to need you guys all too to create that atmosphere and be that sixth man for us. Well, talk we, about we your season opener, frogs Coach. Night. Sorry, Wes, what would you say? Yeah, uh, we need to go ahead, Wes. Frogs night at women's basketball. Well, let's get it done. Get it figured Good. out. Ryan, That's you know where my office is out, so come find me. We'll put that on Ryan's schedule. It's all, uh, <laughs> that sounds awesome. That's a great idea, Wes. We're definitely going to do that. So I'll... Actually, you know what? Just a little history. We did that once. Years ago, when Jeff Mitty was the head coach, I uh, have a feeling Larry Tidwell was behind that. Yeah, well, not, yeah, we just brought in pizza for everybody in the Killer Frog section, and then yeah. uh, afterwards, the coach came over and talked to everybody. It was it was great. We had a, we had pretty good representation there. A lot of people. We'll so again. anyway, That's easy. there you we'll go, Ryan. Again. Make it happen. Yeah, we'll we'll it definitely happen. do it. Yeah, between yeah. the the bus trips to OU and and Tech, we'll definitely do that with uh, with women's basketball. But your your season, you mentioned it starts next week, starts on Saturday, uh, and it's a two o'clock game. So for for everybody who's not yep. going to Norman, they need to go out and and see the game against what, Oral Roberts, right? Two o'clock. Yep, against the Talking Bobs. We're playing <laughs> Oral Roberts two o'clock on Saturday. Um, and Oral Roberts, you know, our, our preseason schedule this year, um, hopefully we didn't over over schedule ourselves. Um, but we've got uh, the majority of the teams all went to postseason play, Oral Roberts being one of them. And uh, great program last year. They beat, I think it was three or four BCS teams. Um, they've got a, an almost a, a huge part of their roster back. Um, they're a big team, very well coached team. Uh, we're excited to have them here, and it's a, a great first test for us um, to kind of see where we're at. And then we follow that game up pretty quickly on the following Tuesday at SMU, um, our crosstown rivals. Also a, a team that was in the postseason who went pretty far in the WNIT. And, um, but, you know, we've had a great off season, and I love where our team's at. We're not near our potential yet, but we're not supposed to be. We've got to keep refining and working on things um, as uh, our team continues to get healthy, stay healthy, um, and get ready for Big 12 play. Excellent. Yeah, and that should be a really good game against Oral Roberts. And I, I you guys, you, you're right. I mean, your, your early schedule, you guys are coming out of the gate like gangbusters and it's going to be interesting <laughs> to see because you got Oral Roberts, then a couple of days later SMU, and then you come back with Texas State and then Yale. So yeah. within a matter of a week and a half, you guys you guys have a lot of really good games back to back. Right, and then we open December up pretty quickly with uh, Alabama here at home, and then we're at Texas A and M. Um, we'll at Thanksgiving we'll go to the Cal State Northridge tournament where we'll play Arizona in the first round. Idaho, who's been to the NCAA tournament, I believe six years in a row. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, one game after the next, we're gonna we're gonna get tested, and we'll we'll learn a lot about ourselves early. So what's the conference outlook this year? Well, the Big 12 is always very good. And I think uh, this is its strongest year in um, probably four or five years. And, you know, Texas uh, is and Baylor are ranked two and three in the country. West Virginia, I believe, is in the top 12, top 13. 
um, it, it's again a very very tough conference, which is exciting to be a part of. And you know, last year, our uh, our team again, one of the youngest BCS teams in the country with the ten freshmen and sophomores. Um, you know, we we didn't end up with as many wins as we wanted to, but I loved how we were we we're in almost every single game, and we lost six games by I think it was uh, two or three possessions or less. And we just have to learn how to turn that corner at the end of the game and close games out. I think our depth is important for that. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it's going to be a great Big 12 women's basketball season. And I, I think this is a year where we could end up with six or seven teams in the NCAA tournament from our league. Wow. Gosh, that, that's pretty salty. Yeah. Wow. it's You know, and, and again, from the men's side and the women's side, we just – both have a great reputation across the country and that continues to attract great recruits. Um, but it, it makes for every game that you want to come into the show, my arena to see uh, an exciting one. You're going to see great talent and great coaching. Fantastic. Yeah. That's, that's always been a really nice thing ever since we got into the big 12. Cause we knew basketball was going to be a tough, is going to be a tough nut to crack. Cause this was a really good basketball conference, but uh, yeah. you, you and coach Dixon, you guys make us proud because it's it's well, been really you. really nice. <laughs> thank you. We're we're proud to be here, and I'll tell you, I, I say it a lot, but I don't want it to be uh, sound like a broken record or cliche. But I love working with Coach Dixon and his staff, and uh, their guys are great guys. We had a great time traveling with them, um, our two teams to Australia this summer, which I think we're the only only school in the country to have done that so far that we know of where both the men and women went on a foreign tour together. Um, but we, we share a common vision. We share a common why and how, um, and, uh, we're, we're very determined to get our teams to the top of the big 12. Did you find some recruits down there? We did. We did. We're excited about what, uh, what's hopefully going to happen that way for both of us. Good. Coach Pedley, I had a question. Uh, how common are those trips? Do you guys go every year out of the country, or is it like once every couple of years? The NCA rules that we can go once every four years. Okay. Um, and so, it and really, what's happened now? Um, all the BCS schools go once every four years. Both of our programs hadn't been in, I think, five or six years. It'd been a while. Okay. Um, and we needed to do it. Um, when you go recruiting, they the recruits don't ask you uh, if you're going. They're asking you when and where you're going. There's an expectation that it's going to happen. Okay. Um, so it's uh, we'll we'll be heading out again uh, in the next four years, and hopefully we'll do it together again. Uh, but it's uh, it's a great experience for the student athletes because you get an advantage of ten additional practices in your preparation, uh, you get competition, additional competition. And, you know, the other part of it is student athletes don't get to do study abroad very much, if at all. Definitely. And so this gives them a chance to be able to experience that a little bit. And it helps them get exposure to teams for a chance to play um, after college for a little bit when they go overseas. Huh. Do you know where you're going in four years? Oh, goodness. Uh, there's so much preparation and money that go into it. I, I told Jamie next year we're driving to Tijuana or not next year, the next four years we'll go to Tijuana or we'll go to Juarez, Mexico. <laughs> I don't Taking know student athletes to with... Tijuana or Juarez. Um... <laughs> yeah. I went to school in El Paso. I would say not Juarez. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So well, that might very... be. That that would that would be a very interesting trip. But the the trip yeah. you guys did take the the photos that you guys brought back, the videos that uh, that were posted both on GoFrogs and and uh, on Twitter from y'all's accounts, just it looked like everyone was just having a great time. And, it couldn't uh, have gone better. It couldn't have. We just had an incredible time, and uh, it God's hands were all over that entire trip and the entire experience. And uh, we are so fortunate to be able to have done it. Now, did y'all go to Sydney and Melbourne and any place in between, or is it just the two major cities? We went to Sydney and Melbourne, um, those two cities, and we really wanted to focus on those two cities uh, because, you know, sometimes if you're just, if you go to too many cities, you don't really get to spend enough time in them and see everything, right. and you're so rushed. Um, and also, Melbourne was going to be, Sydney was really important because it's Sydney, but also... 
um, the men's team have a couple of players from that area. Mm-hmm. And uh, we wanted to make sure we had enough time to be able to really invest there. And then Melbourne is a hotbed for women's basketball talent. And we have a player from there. So uh, that's why we focused on those two cities. We went um, outside of Melbourne about an hour and a half uh, and spent a day at an Aboriginal women's school, which is a boarding school for kids that um, come from pretty violent backgrounds. And yeah. we spent the day out there. And that was, uh, man, that was incredible. That was such a cool day. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, as you know, my wife's from Australia. So anytime yeah. you guys go down there, I'm always, um, I'm always interested. This, and that was, <laughs> this is the first year in like the past 10 or 12, I haven't gone down to Australia. So it's, uh, wow. I kind of missed it, but, uh, it's a wonderful place. If you've never been there, you need to board a plane from DFW and head on down because it's a great trip. Yeah. I'm it still is. waiting I'll for that you kangaroo. That you promised me. Yeah. I, it's coming. It's coming. Okay. That was pretty funny seeing a whole plane fill, filled of like six foot two and taller people crammed in coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that's a long flight. It is. It is. Yes, but worth it. it. Is. Yeah, trips like hours. trips like that as a student athlete or just as a student alone is is just worth its weight because when I was with the uh, with the TCU jazz band, we had an opportunity to go tour Europe. And uh, like you were talking about, you, when you see two, when you're in too many cities, you just don't have a lot of time. And we started in Budapest and ended up in Switzerland. And we were only out Holy there for, cow. yeah, like a week and a half. And it was, we're on a bus most of the time. And we didn't have a whole lot of time. Literally, we got into Vienna, Austria. We got off the bus and the director is like, okay, uh, Kurt Wilson's like, okay, you guys got like uh, six hours. And then get back mm-hmm. on the bus and we got to go. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> go. you're a bunch of musicians and we're <laughs> yeah. in Vienna, Austria. And you say we have six hours. <laughs> It was, it was just, it was, that was kind of a crazy kind of a thing. It's not enough time to. No, it's not. Yeah. But the, but the experience though, as a student to be able to go abroad with a lot of the students just have never even been outside of Texas. um, Right. It's just amazing. It's an amazing experience and it's a life changing experience. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, really nice to see that you guys were able to do that. It's uh, too bad. You can't do that more often. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, we couldn't have done it without uh, the support of a lot of the people probably listening to this call. So um, again, there's we've got hearts filled with gratitude for the chance that we could go do it. Excellent. Well, like I said, Coach, you guys make us so proud as TCU fans and alumni, and just keep doing what you're doing because it's you. it's really paying off. And uh, again, for everybody, two o'clock this Saturday. If you're not going to Norman, get over to the Showmeyer and go watch the women play against Oral Roberts. Uh, they need your support and uh, cheer on a frog victory, hopefully here in Fort Worth, and then also one uh, later that night in Norman, Oklahoma. So awesome. we're we're looking forward well, to the season. Thank you guys. Coach. Thank you, and we'll uh, we're work work hard to continue to make you guys proud. Well, thanks, Coach. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Coach. Right. Bye bye. Take care. Thanks, Coach. And that was women's head coach Reagan Peebley. Uh, really, guys, I, this this is going to be a very good season for women's basketball, and um, I, I think that they're they're looking really good to probably make the tournament. But like she said, this is going to be a tough conference. Yeah. Now they had a nationally ranked class last year, didn't they? Yes. In recruiting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did. Sorry, you caught you caught me mid sip there. <laughs> no, that's all right. Just, I just, just ahead of you. Yeah. But no, that's good. I mean, she's got the talent, and I think she's a great person, a great, great coach for this team and his school, and uh, it's going to be fun to watch them. It really is. Well, let's uh, let's get down to football. We've talked women's soccer, women's basketball, and and let's talk a little football because <laughs> there there was a game on Saturday night, and yes, there was. Uh, against the University of Texas. And uh, let's go through our game recap. And this week's game recap is brought to you by Rar Brewery. Yay. And so, uh, prost, y'all. <laughs> yes. Prost. Prost. I wish I had an ugly pug right now. Uh, yes. Well, you yeah. know that USS oh. Fort Worth that they uh, they came out with in, in celebration of that one? I, that's like a, a session beer. I love that one. That's so good. So, we, we can talk beer all day long, but the audience will probably get really bored with it. Um, well, there- will be some some raw they're sponsoring our bus trip so all of y'all who are signed up for the OE bus trip get ready because it's you're gonna have a lot of really good raw raw beer on that trip i can't oh, wait I wish I could come. oh my gosh do that. that's what you get for having your daughter plan her wedding during the <laughs> ou game 
you miss I'll out tell on you my ex wife put her up to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, Wes. I'll have two or six for you. It's it's yeah. okay. Thank it's you. Okay. I know you will. It's Think of me, me when you drink that. I, and that's, I will. You know, for those, I'm sure everybody knows this, but it, you know, Rob Brewing is um, Horn Frog owned, so that's um, that's what it makes that place even better. And their their kids are at TCU and um, pretty. They bleed purple. Fritz Roar was a swimmer, wasn't he? Yeah, I think. Yeah, actually, I think you're right. I think you're right. Hey, we need to get him on the podcast sometime. Talk about those days. Hey, that'd be okay. Let's then we'll it. have an entire podcast about beer. There we go. I know. <laughs> that works. I'm good with that. And that'd be a good. All right. Well, uh, so let's go with the recap of this game. The Longhorns roll into Fort Worth and uh, with their vaunted, amazing defense and uh, come away with their tail between their legs as they lose 24-7 to the TCU Horned Frogs. And let's talk a little bit about this game. And this was a game in front of 48,042 people, which was the sixth largest crowd in Amon G. Carter's history. And, uh, guys, let's first talk about defense because this whole game was billed as the two best defenses in the Big 12. And, uh, Dubber, let me start with you. What did you see out of the TCU defense, and what did you see out of the UT defense? Well, I do think they're right still. I think those were the two best defenses. I just think our defense is uh, just a little bit better, a little more mature, a little bit. You know, we've got depth. I mean, everything Coach Patterson's been talking about, you know, and, man, they played good Saturday. I mean, they – they uh, every week I think they get a little better and a little better, and – uh our front seven, they're 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 really becoming a formidable group. Uh, I don't see many out there better than them. There's, I mean, you know, the defense is great all the way around, but our front seven, and with that depth, man, we're and, and knock on wood, we haven't had many injuries and stuff like that. And so, so man, I oh you now know, you've said it. I know, I know. Every knock on. Jeez. Yeah, quick throw off of your shoulder. And then I'll say, uh, you got plenty you know, of wood in I, here for everybody. I also will say this about Texas defense. You know, I, I wasn't disappointed in the game <laughs> at all. I didn't, you know, everybody, some people talked about, you know, we look sluggish or this or that on offense. Texas got a good defense. Texas made a lot of people look silly this year. Texas have held some really good teams down. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I do believe, I said, uh, that's the toughest defense. You know, even though Iowa State shut us out last week, I still believe that Texas had a better defense. Uh, well, think, again, I mean, our offense had, what, 11 penalties and three yeah. turnovers? I mean, that yep. was that's hard to overcome for any, for yep. any offense. They, they schemed us pretty good. So, anyway, I think, uh, you know, but it also goes down to what I said, you know, uh, did you win the defense? Yeah, we won defense. We won offense. Actually, we won special teams, too. That's why yeah. the score. I never – after we scored 10 points, I, I felt like we were we were, we were were okay. I didn't think well, they could score on our defense. No, I, I tell you what, their their defense is pretty darn good. but And they're fast on – it's hard for us to get out on the edge because they're, they're, they're team speed. But uh, and, and they kept away any, any chance of us turning the corner on them pretty well. But as you know, we were able to go up the middle on them with almost with ease. Not quite that easy, but you know, we could. Um, we were able to get up there and, and move on them. I uh, just wish we could have had more points. But you know, they got a good defense. They have come a long, long way, and uh, they had the kind of defense. I read one writer say, "What kind of defense did Charlie Strong wish he could have put together there?" But um, yeah, they're 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 going to be a force to contend with in the years to come. But if Tom Herman makes it, their fans are already all, all over him. So, and yeah, I, I, Shaggy yeah. Bevo was rather or Shaggy Texas or whatever they had to change their name to. Now they were they were pretty. Um, uh, I don't, upset's not quite the right word. Um, morose, I guess, from the uh, from the game. I mean, it was oh, pretty their, bad. Their fans are a real piece of work. I mean, I ran into some yesterday at Bucky's, and it just okay, you know. Well, no, no, wait, wait, wait! Don't, don't just gloss over that. Tell us exactly. I'll, I'll bleep it, but go ahead and tell us exactly okay. what they told you. All right, I always stop up at the Bucky's and Temple on the way up there for the game and get an iced tea, get some gas, and so I filled up and I, I'm wearing my purple, 
And of course, I walk into the place, and it's just, it's like an orange ocean in there, you know. And um, a couple of them came up and said, "Hey, are you going to the game?" I said, "Yeah, I sure am." And he said, well, "We're going to kick your ass." And I said, "Well, you might, or we might kick your ass again, you know." And, uh, and so, <laughs> so, ah, well, good luck. I thank you. But you know, that's just uh, the kind of that in-your-face arrogance. And then I'm sure he walked. I didn't see him at Bucky's when I stopped off on the way back home to get my get some more iced tea. But uh, you know, he uh, I couldn't believe he came up to me and said that. But I couldn't pass up the opportunity to say, "Well, you might, but we might kick your ass again." I guess he wasn't basing that on any historical um, evidence, right? No, he just. <laughs> He's just being a Texas fan. What can you say? Well, this They're- we up until last night we had won three straight, and last night made it four straight, and that puts us into, I guess, a special category. I think the only other team that's beaten UT four straight times twice because we did it back in the '30s, um, I think was OU. Uh, I think yeah. I read that correctly. So TCU and OU are the only two teams to have ever beaten Texas four times in a row twice in their history. So. Tells you a little bit about the state of uh, UT football. Yeah, and they're—I mean, they're—they were just horrible on offense. You know, you—you right. you saw where they, with a few breaks here and there, they could be pretty good. But you know, they—they have some linemen that are down. They couldn't block. They couldn't run. I mean, what they have? Three nine yards nine yards of rushing yesterday. Nine yards of rushing. Nine. I mean, that's embarrassing. Uh, just, just, just to give you a little heads up. I, I think Kansas had more yards. Yikes. Didn't they? Yep. I think they did because of that last series against our twos and threes. Yeah, Yeah, if they wouldn't have the 43-yard pass either, it wouldn't have looked as good there. That's true. (laughs) Hey, y'all, listen to this. So, in the you know, that's our fourth year. We beat them since 2014. They scored nine, seven, ten, and seven points. So we have scored 153 points to their 33 over the last four seasons. Gosh, that just breaks my heart. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> Sorry, Dober, what were you going to say? Oh, I mean, I just, you know, I was going to say there, it's, I thought it was funny today. I was listening to some people that were, they're Texas people, and they're ready to hang Bouchelle, and they're ready to, you know, they're and the other kid, the the kid that got hurt. And I told y'all at the very first, was, Yeah. He didn't I, even I told play. y'all the very first of the year, they were saying Texas had no quarterback, you know, and I'm like, I told y'all way back the first year that they would need two quarterbacks because they have no offensive line. They got right. two pretty good quarterbacks. I'll still say it. They have no offensive line. The problem it's, is not their quarterback. It's the no, line. it's amazing to me that Texas, with all their five-star recruits, four-star recruits, and that's the best line they can put out there. Yeah. Hey, yeah. And I'll tell you the truth. I hope they get mad at Herbert and fire him because he, <laughs> I, I mean, I hope they're that stupid because he's, he, he's going to be a good coach for them. And actually guys, I wanted to say a little bit about that. Uh, that very much touched on what dad said with all those big recruits. So uh, I, I was just looking back. I, I went back to 2012 and I said, Hey, let's see Texas's recruiting class, what they were ranked and what TCU's was ranked. And uh, this ought to here's, be good. What, here's what we came up with. Okay, so in 2012, Texas is number two. All right. TCU is 29. Mm-hmm. Uh, Charlie Strong era starts, Texas 17. So they go down a little bit. TCU is 35 still, so we're double. Next year, Texas is also 17. We're 43. They move back up to 10 the next year. We're 39. They go to seven the next year. We're 21. Their lowest ranked class is 25, and we still don't beat them that year. We're 28, and this year they are picked to be number two, and we're 21st. And they have that offensive line with those recruiting classes. They are a, they are, a, it's a death knell to be a freaking Texas recruit at this point. You, how do you not, rec- how do you not have any good play? How do you not have NFL stars just coming out of this program with those high recruits? Well, you know, they come in there with those. I mean, a lot of them are prima donnas. I think that's been proven. And and they come in there as good as they're ever going to be because the Texas coaches up to this point and, and maybe beyond have not had the ability to develop those guys in anything better. 
by contrast, Gary Patterson recruits those two and three star players and turns them into four and five star players. And, and they are only, they are better when they leave TCU than they were when they came there. And you can't say it about the Texas guys. They're just they have that sense of entitlement. And uh, by God, we're Texas and we're going to win because of it. And no, that's not true. And uh, anyway, so it's uh, it's it's been an interesting dynamic to watch. I'll even do you one better. Like to me, if you're a four or five star recruit, you have the NFL aspirations the second you step on the field. You you have a chance. You are a guy who they go, this guy is on somebody's radar right off the bat. And Texas is has tons of those guys. But then you look at Texas guys getting rec- drafted, and it is way below that. Even you you could say not even are they not developing. Sometimes they are getting worse going into college, and I don't even know how that happens. It's maddening to me, but I yeah. can't help but love it being a TCU fan, but it is just maddening. It's culture. Yeah. I mean, we, we talk, we've been talking about culture. It's just – it's that culture down in Texas. It's that, that, that arrogant, you know, we are better than everybody else because we're Texas. I mean, and just listening to their fans. I mean, Wes, your your experience was certainly not the uh, an isolated one. If you read the board at all this week uh, or today, actually, a lot of wow. people were saying the same thing. Even after they were losing, they were down seventeen nothing. There were still fans, you know, from Texas in the stands giving our our fans a hard time about it. It's just it's well, just yeah, the mentality then, they have. You know, you go to Shaggy Bevo and they're saying stuff like, "I can't believe we lost to that team with some." Uh, with a gimmick offense playing yeah. in a high school stadium. And to some of their fans' credits, they're saying, oh, wait a minute, you obviously didn't go there because that's a darn nice stadium those people put together. But, you know, that's that's a lot of their attitude. If it doesn't hold 100,000 people, then it's got to be a high school stadium, right? Well, well it's the I same mean, bias we, we see from the media when it comes to, quote-unquote, blue bloods. I mean, yeah. Ohio State, Alabama, Michigan, LSU. I mean, we, when you're talking about these giant big state schools – it's almost as though a prerequisite to become a blue blood, blue blood in these days is to have a stadium that holds 90,000 plus. And, yeah. you know, it, it's unfortunate. But as we were talking about this on the board this week, I, I made a comment that, you know, that that sort of bias, that sort of arrogance is is really because it's a, it's a holdover from the 80s and the 90s. And yeah. when TC wasn't yeah. doing very good at all. And of course, a lot of these sports writers and a lot of a lot of fans don't have a clue what sort of contributions TCU has made to this sport going all the way back to, you know, twenties and the thirties and the forties and the fifties. And if yeah. they understood that history, they would realize, you know, we're actually a real blue blood. We're just, we just kind of walked in the desert for 30 years. Yeah, exactly. And it's, I mean, it's, you talk about the media and I think they just clamor for Texas to, to be a top 10 team because and that's evident because they all the Texas perennially in the top 10 in preseason rankings. And then they're, the, you know, they're like, they may not even be in the top 50 after the end of the season. And we have to earn our way up every time. And, uh, but Texas, you know, it's just a given preseason rankings come out. Texas is going to be eight or 10 or maybe, maybe 11 or 12 with the, the writers got a headache or something, but still, you know, it's just, it's a foregone conclusion. They're going to be top 10 team at starting the season. And they're going to be in the bottom 30 or 40 or lower at the end of the season. Yeah. And I don't, I don't mind that so much. I don't mind the fact that TCU has to play their way up. I think it's great, but to go back to what Hunter was saying, it's like, how can you have all these things going for you? How can you have this recruiting class? How can you have all these expectations and everybody just basically just giving you kind of like, you know, turning a blind eye to all the other things that are going on. And you still put that product out on the field. And you still – you can't have an offensive line. Your, your twos can't even yeah. match up to TCU's ones. Is, is that is that what you're trying to tell me? Because you're Texas. You have your a number two returning class. Twos and threes D-line. The guys who are rotating in after Banigou and Boson and those guys. I mean, and not saying we don't have a deep D-line this year. But, I mean, there's guys can't handle – crap, they can't handle anybody. <laughs> no. What, seven oh, sacks on the day? Seven. Most since 2014 for a TCU defense. Yeah, and and if Boson didn't pull a Batman, it probably would have been eight. <laughs> I mean, and if you haven't seen that photo, by the way, go on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Killer Frogs. I, I did a little Photoshop. It's a picture of Boson jumping up at, at Bouchelle, and I put, a, I put a little Batman cape on him. So, Pretty great. Yeah, thanks. But uh, Killer bees are great. 
Oh, they are fantastic, and they did exactly what we what we thought they would. The killer bees are is that? Are we the only ones calling that, or is that? Uh, they've had a little bit of that on Twitter, but not maybe the killer bees, just the bees, and you know all that. But the bees are definitely known. It cannot be ours, killer bees. Can we make T-shirts with that? Can I we, think I think that? we should because we're see one dogs. That one's yeah. ours. And remember, next season Brandon Boson will be healthy again, or Brandon. Brandon Bowen, and there'll be another killer bee in there. So, yeah, right. again. So, uh, hopefully, we can keep Banigu. Yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope so, because he had a great game. Yeah, oh, back to back sacks. That was awesome. Yeah. So the way I like to look at this, I mean, more than the way I don't know. The way I like to look at it is, I look at Texas as having an average to below offense, but they they scored points on Oklahoma. 24. They scored points on uh, USC. Mm-hmm. They scored points on well, all the other play, the teams they played. I look at it more that we just got a dang good defense. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when I when I look at it, I do agree with everything everybody's saying. But more than that, I just believe that our defense is that good. This our is defense, a- I mean, uh, we are we are in a run. Of seeing some exceptional defense, and that, maybe not yardage at the first of the year, but keeping the keeping points down and stuff like that. Now they're just kind of growing into their own now. Yeah, and I mean, look you know, at some of the teams we we're playing. I mean, to keep look at Oklahoma State yesterday. We held them to what was it, twenty four? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the it's we're going against top offenses every week and just continually just shutting them down. So, as I agree with you that Texas' offense line is bad, because I'm the first one that says it, our defense is that much better, too. I mean, because we, we embarrassed them up front. I mean, you score seven points, we, we pretty much shut you down. I mean, and uh, – It was the lowest point total of the entire season. Yeah. And uh, for yep. them for them not to be able to score anything, do anything against our uh, defense is – I mean, I ain't mean, – it's 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 shaping up to be a pretty good year. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. This is. I mean, I I always hesitate to use this word, but this is one of the elite defenses in college football. Currently, we're ranked sixth in, in total defense, and there's Washington, Alabama, Wisconsin, uh, Georgia ahead of us. But I can't. If those defenses are that much better, that that's scary. Washington. Our, yeah. I, I would say I, I would put Washington and TCU as probably the top two defenses right now, only because of the conferences that we play in. Because yeah. we're, we're we're in a very pass happy conference and very high high octane offense, whereas right. you know Alabama and Georgia they're more pound you know ground pound kind of kind of games and. You know, I not take anything away from Alabama or Georgia. I think they're both fantastic teams. I think they both have great defenses. But if you just look in the the type of conferences that both Washington and TCU plays in, I think Washington and TCU are probably the two top defenses right now in the country. Um, I can't argue that. Yeah, and or if if you want to put Alabama in there as one of the top defenses, I won't begrudge you. But certainly top three, you have to give it to. You know, TCU's definitely in the top three. We're, we're definitely the best in the Big 12, and we're probably one of the best defenses, rushing defenses in the country, period. Yeah, no doubt about it. And Nick Saban's a hell of a defensive coach, and his old protege, Kirby Smart, and now at, at Georgia, is a is another good defensive coordinator. I don't know anything about the Washington defensive coordinator, but, you know, they, these guys, no defense. And um, uh, it, it'd be fun to watch them. I'd, I'd love to see it match up against those guys one time just to see – how our defense fared against their offenses. But, you know, hopefully that chance will come this this year. Well, we'll definitely get a chance to see how we fare against Ohio State next year. So yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. That, that'll be an interesting game. So, uh, Ryan, you, you made a mention you wanted to talk a little bit about attendance, and this was the uh, – no, you don't want to talk about attendance? Yeah, I was just getting out my notes. Oh, okay. well, we, we can, we can oh. double back if you want. Uh, she made notes. Yeah. Okay. Are you still back at 12 pages of notes now? Yeah. Single spaced. I know that people like to Google stuff and prove you wrong even and not give you the benefit of the doubt. But, um, but oh, gosh. I, mean, I guess last last week, Wes, you got your, your rant, I think. And then this week I might get mine. But um, oh, so always on Killer Frogs, it can be a beating. And, it, and it's fine to an extent, but um, 
just the attendance beat down every single game. It just gets old. And I guess people aren't, there's just so many facts that people aren't thinking about. I mean, our stadium holds what, maybe not even 40, 45,000, I guess, give or take, standing room, non-standing room. Just the other day, I heard someone say, wow, I wish we would have made our, our basketball coliseum bigger. And I was like, what, to fill it up with opposing teams, fans? Because it's the exact size we need it to be to be loud and fill it up with purple people. Because we are a small school. I know we're in a big metroplex, but being in a big metroplex means you divide your time I don't even, I don't even, you could, the list is lengthy of what everybody does on a Saturday in the Metroplex, especially if you have kids, you've got peewee competing against peewee football, soccer, girls, softball. I don't even know what else is going on. Um, so just, just some facts for people who aren't aware. And, and I, I did not have a chance to look up um, A&M's and even Texas, but let's just keep this in mind. A&M has about 50,000 students, give or take. So with that in mind, TCU has 75,000 living alumni. That's it. And that's across the world. That's not in Texas. That's across the world. Um, then we have 9,000 students, which is tiny. We're smaller than Baylor. We're the smallest in our conference. That's why we don't want our football stadium to be bigger. We don't want to see that, you know, bunch of opposing fans. Um, of those 9,000 students, a minimum of 60% are women or girls. And wait, wait, now, wait a minute. What are you saying, Ryan? <laughs> well, this is what I'm saying. Listen. So, if you Other than the fact that, that this is a really good fact for recruiting. I know. Well, and, and guys love the fact that there's more girls here. But we, we leave. We graduate TC and we marry guys from who are Aggies, Longhorns, Sooners, Buckeyes and so on and so forth. So on Saturdays, they're going with their husbands to other games or watching them on TV, right? And then I did hear this fun fact from Del Conte a few weeks ago that out of the 9,000 TCU students, we get about 8,000 to the game. That's insane. That's something that we should clap about because I don't think other schools get get that turnout. Um, so as far as filling up the, the stadium during the third quarter and – you know, during kickoff, um, we do a good job. We sell out our season tickets every year. We're never going to be a an Alabama. We just don't have the fan base. We're not a college town. We're a metroplex, and I'm pretty proud of what we've done, what we've accomplished in the two the you know the two thousands. I guess that's how you say it. Not you don't really say it like the nineteen hundreds. Sounds weird, but anyway, in the last 15, 16, 17 years since we were all there. Um, so I wish I wish we would just start recognizing what we've done well instead of just crying after every game about who's not sitting in their seat because we yeah. do a pretty good job. <sighs> That's it. Okay. You know what? You're exactly right. And people need a little perspective. And I always go back to when I was in school there back, you know, in the 1800s. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, when I – to us, a good crowd when, let's say, Texas came to town was 35,000. Of which about 20,000 were Texas fans. And our fan base was about a solid 10 or 15,000 people. Our season tickets were about 10 or 15,000 on a good year. Now they're about 35,000 or more. Uh, our fan base has increased because of the winning and the, and the and dedication that, uh, that TCU had made to the, or the commitment TCU's made to the athletic program. So uh, people think, you know, yeah, it's if you don't have a full house, it's a, it's a failure and a, and a loss. But that's not true. I, I can tell you when we've had 10,000 people in the stands and it's embarrassing, uh, you know, and so uh, we people don't realize how far we've come and how hard it's been. But we've gotten there and it continues to get better every year, every day. And if some people aren't in the seats, so what? So what? Big deal. You know, we're we're our, our crowds are good. Our our fan base is larger and strong and loud, and that's what it needs to be. And um, uh, you know, it's just eyes up and keep climbing. And I, I'll just throw in this one last thing. I remember when Dennis Francione was here, his second year, first or second year, and he came out on the field, and looked up in the stand out because I was standing there taking pictures right before the game, and I kind of looked at him. I was going to grab a quick shot of him, and I remember him looking. 
looking up on the west side stands, looking up, look at the crowd and kind of shaking his head and going, geez, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't hear him say geez, but you could, <laughs> you could read his facial expressions and his body language. And it was disappointing because we had no people there. We do now. So if you got a few, few empty seats, big deal, they'll fill up over time. Just keep winning. It'll take care of itself. Yeah. And I think a lot of the complaints are just fans that are just upset. The fact that they see so many opposing fans in, in some of the good seats, so to speak. Um, I know we have a couple of posters who like to point that out all the time and they will remain <laughs> nameless. Um, point on killer frogs about how some of those fans probably wear purple out of, you know, five of the six home games and that one home game where they got their master's degree or maybe they went to undergrad, they wear, they wear orange or they wear red out of that one game. And I thought, oh, you know, I've never thought of it that way, but that's, that's true. I mean, we root for more than one team sometimes in the Metroplex. Yeah. I think what Wacker oh. called them, the, uh, the 10, 10 game purple. Yeah. 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 And, and that's, and that's fine. And you know, it's understandable, but yeah, it, it is the, the attendance thing I think is more along the lines of where some of the opposing fans end up sitting as far as the good seats mm-hmm. on the West side. Or, or what's considered to be the good seats on the west side, and I'm I'm not even I've I've always been an east sider, you know. If we want to talk west side, east side, I've always been an east sider. I kind of like the east side, except for when it's like 100 degrees outside and the sun's blaring right at your face. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't necessarily think there's a good place or a bad place in that stadium. I think all the sight lines are great, and I understand it's it's the premium seats that people are upset about. It's like you can't, you know, why are, why are our opposing fans getting premium seats in the clubs? But, yeah, you, you have a good point. Well, a lot of those guys, you know, they didn't go undergrad to TCU. They went, you know, graduate school. They went postgrad to TCU. Uh, and some of them went undergrad to TCU, but then went postgrad to other schools. And and so, you know, they, they have split allegiances. And I'm, I'm not begrudging them. I'm not begrudging some of the corporate sponsors that like to give their tickets away to some of their employees who want to sit mm-hmm. there for whatever reason. Again, not a problem. Um, but just like we're talking about with the sportscaster issue, it's like, you know, the bias that, that they are under right now probably won't go away until we have a new crop of sports announcers who are used to seeing TCU up at the top. You know, it, we're probably not going to have this problem go away anytime soon until those season ticket holders move on and we have new season ticket holders in there. Yeah. So. You know what's funny, though, is like we have extra tickets. And we're part of that plus four that a lot of people hate. And um, I, can't even, I can't even give away the tickets. That's, I mean, to some games, and I sure as heck can't sell them for face value. So, I mean, when you can't even give away your tickets or sell them for face value, um, you know, it's not it's not the season ticket holders' fault all the time. Well, and, and let's be clear about this because it, it's not necessarily because you can't find any TCU fans who won't take it because the TCU fans already got their seats. They have to, it's the yeah. fact that the opposing fans, their their fan bases don't travel. I mean, this this game filled up because it was Texas. And because there's such a huge contingent of Texas fans that are in the area. But if you go back and take a look at, you know, some of the other take away, you know, Jackson State. OK, it's Jackson State. And but it's at, 120 degrees. <laughs> right. I mean, SMU can't even get, you know, more than 900 people in their own stands. They're not bringing anybody over here to Fort Worth. Oh, that, that SMU crowd was embarrassing. And then they had I bet they didn't have 200 fans here and their team probably have one of their better years in a long time. Yeah. You know, and I know their coach is probably going through the same frustrations as Dennis Francione. A&M. They're bowl old. He's going to AM. Yeah, yeah, well, probably so. And I wouldn't blame him because he gets no support from the fans there. Yeah. At least we'll have support and criticism <laughs> from from the from the AM fans if he ends up going there. Yeah. We all know about the criticism. Yeah, if you haven't heard, Ryan mentioned that that A and M has fifty thousand students, but they have one. They're they're down one head coach now. <laughs> Someone <laughs> someone's out. So we're is thinking officially fired, or are they just? I think at the end, I read that they're. If, if it isn't official, it's a really crap way of of keeping the lid on it. Because yeah, there was there was a lot of inside sources quoted uh, today, and all the stories about Kevin Sumlin saying. They're basically telling the uh, marketing people and all the all the pub operations, everyone to get up statements ready for after the season when they let him go and, you know, figuring out who's going to uh, coach the bowl game and everything. And there's, so it looks like it's not happening right away, but uh, give it a couple weeks. And Have they won six there. games yet? I haven't been following. No, they, but they play, I will say, they play New Mexico next week. So, yeah, uh, you know, that's that SEC gimme game in November that they always do, mm-hmm. the – no, because they're the superior conference. 
know what? He, he, he has not won a uh, SEC West Division game in, what, 753 days or something like that. So he's had two years. Yeah, you know, and without any kind of SEC wins as far as in in their division, so I mean, yeah, there's a lot of frustration down there. And, well, and what are they paying him? Six million a year? I mean, it's incredible. It's it's a lot of money. But uh, let's talk about other teams who haven't had a whole lot of success in recent years, and let's talk about the UT offense for a moment yeah. um, against That'll the take uh, thirty seconds. Yeah, against the TCU defense. Um, Actually, let's switch this up. Let's talk about the TCU offense for a moment because I think we've we've talked a little bit about the Killer Bees, the front seven, and and you know the ineptness of of O or excuse me UT in that particular regard. So, you know, the beginning of the game, it looked like the offense was clicking. It looked like mm-hmm. TCU's offense was doing good. We go down there, we score, get Hicks on that one yard touchdown run. Um, go down again. We have to settle for a field goal, but like like Dubber said, you know, we got to ten, and I, I turned to you, Wes, and. And I, and I even posted this on the board, and I got I caught a lot of flack for doing it. I said, that might just be enough to win this game when we get to 10. But it seemed like right after that, it, it, I don't know. What, was it just that Texas adjusted, or was it that Patterson went conservative? Well, I think it could be a combination of both. Texas, I def- think, definitely adjusted, because you expect somebody that runs a good defense to do that, but – they just they did go into a a shell on the offense, and I don't understand that. Uh, I, I I don't know what the deal was, but you know Kenny Kenny Hill looked great that first quarter. I mean he was just and then but and the, and the play selection was great. Then it's like we had two different uh, offensive coordinators, one for the first quarter and one for the second, and they didn't swap notes at all between them. I mean it, it was it was different. It was weird. Because we're better than that. But maybe Texas, maybe I wasn't seeing everything. And maybe Texas was taking away some of the things we wanted to do. I, I don't know. But it it was uh, definitely two different teams out there. What do you guys think? I also think it was a combination of both. Uh, you know, I, I think we knew going into this game that they were not very good on offense and that we only have to do so much to win. And maybe that's strategy. Maybe it's uh, – I mean, yes, it's strategy. Maybe it's trying to hold uh, some cards to your chest before next week. Maybe not Maybe not pull everything out of the old playbook. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it was a very convincing win. I mean, you you beat Texas by three scores. Uh who is a very good defense other than their first game. They've been, you know, they've held everyone pretty low uh, in point wise. So, you know, you can't really be upset about that. Uh, I'd like to see a better game next week offensively, and we're going to have to, to win this game. Yeah. You know, OU is not going to, they're going to be able to score. Now they may not be able to stop anybody. So, you know, we'll see, but I, I think you can't be upset with this game just because of how, you know, who you're playing. You got to get to next week. And we did that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some played. games are made to be ugly, and this was one of those games. Yeah. I mean, I mean that that's the way I look at it. I I don't I'm not disappointed in anything really. I I, I just think that's one of these games is going to be like that. And I think I think you're right in the sense that I think that we probably did get a little conservative, but there's a reason to. I mean, hey, it's kind of like it's kind of like when you're playing basketball, people. People gripe about not running fast break all the time, and you know, getting up down the court and doing this. Well, if you don't have to, your 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 job there's to win a football game. So if winning a football game means winning twenty four to seven, why put your why put your offense in the position to maybe make turnovers and stuff like that when there's no no reason to? I mean, we got we did get conservative and, and stuff like that, but. You know what? We did some good stuff too. Texas got a exceptional front seven, also. I think I still think that. I think I saw some really good times where we ran the ball well against them and stuff like that, and we played some good ball control. And uh, you know, I, looking from a player's perspective, I, I look at that stuff, and I, I, I had no problem with. I, I just didn't have any problem with the game plan. I didn't have any problem with, whether whether they just decided, you know what, we've got a lead and we're going to shut it down. There's no use in putting Kenny in any bad spots or what, you know, it's just right now there wasn't, wasn't no reason to it until they could show that they could score on us. 
I just, like I said, I had no problem. But I did enjoy at the end how they ran the football. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to put this one little plug in here. Anderson's a stud. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just going to tell you right now, and I'm not saying anything bad about Hicks because he's a good football player. But, you know, we're, from where I sit now, because I didn't like that east side that it fried me like a piece of big bacon. So I moved my seat. But I, but I don't mind watching the game from the end zone because that's where I, that's kind of how I watch film. Mm-hmm. And there was probably, to the naked eye, I'd say, but there's probably five times I saw where he should have got he should have got stopped in the backfield or, or no yard gain in it. Dude's incredible. Making a, make a move and making a no yard gain into a three yard gain or a four yard gain. And every time he touches the ball, he has potential to break the long one. Oh my gosh. He is, you're, you're right. He is a stud. And there's, that's not a knock on, on Kyle Hicks because he's just, he, he's, he's, he's in there too. But God, Darius Anderson's at a different level. And can we talk about the uh, the juke move on the thirty one yard touchdown? Oh, did 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 he so, really break his ankle? No, he didn't. Not not Anderson. We're talking about the the, the did not break his ankle, but it looked it like looked it. like he uh, did. <laughs> that, so that guy was the number one safety recruit two years ago, and, uh, and he, he's you know, still so a he's stud. A big he's he's not a guy who's yeah, he's a stud. He's yeah. like he's started for Texas this whole year. He played as a true freshman a whole bunch. And uh, I think Darius Anderson basically just said, I'll show you what my three-star self can do to you. Uh, <laughs> and it was great. I, I watched it about ten times That's today. That's the kind of thing that uh, Devontae Turpin would have done to somebody. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, oh, my gosh. I mean, he, it was just a killer move by him. Uh, he's something special. Yeah, he is. Now, speaking of, 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 of great plays, I, I keep thinking about that one long pass to DRs. Ah, uh, yeah. When he took it, he didn't score a touchdown, but he just flattened that Texas defensive back. You remember that one? Yep, manhandled. Well, he put him on his butt and just ran over him, and that was that was the thing. Well, and, and to set that up, that was the uh, I think that was the only long pass we had in the game. So yeah, that was completed. I mean, we tried a couple other after that, and they were just off target. But, yeah, so Kenny throws the ball. Diars is running a go route down the left sideline. He catches the ball. Uh, he's ahead of he's ahead of the cornerback, but the safety's coming over, and the safety comes over, and Diars just levels the safety. <laughs> and it was almost like a moment where – because he was coming right towards where we were sitting, Wes, and I remember it was like he – levels the safety and then almost for a moment because he's still in play it was almost like he stopped for a moment to look down to kind of be like huh you okay and then kept yeah, going yeah. <laughs> it, was just, it was the craziest thing i'd ever yeah. seen yeah. it was I think great that was a who's your daddy moment yeah and maybe John Deers, uh, there you go. was it it was almost like somebody like swatting a fly like hey you're bothering me kid go away <laughs> for sure it was insane and we talked about DRS. DRS is a, is is a menum of boys out there in the backfield. But oh my gosh, that was just an awesome play. That was. Yeah. So and and like you were saying, Dubber, going back to Anderson, I, it really did surprise me because I was watching that every single time he touched the ball. It he his ability to to cut even in a very very small amount of space and make something out of nothing is yep. what really helped us out because that helped wear down that defensive line of yep. Texas and help open up that big 31-yard run he had later on in the game. Yep. So, yep. I, you know, Anderson is something special. He's 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 I love the guy. He's fantastic to watch. Have you guys got any information? You know, we saw Taj Williams and Emmanuel Porter early in the season. Last week, I guess or a couple weeks ago, Taj makes a return. But neither of those guys have made much. You know, we haven't we haven't seen them. You guys heard anything about uh, those guys, or do you speculate maybe they're just not putting out the effort and practice, so they're not getting the playing time? I mean, that's a mystery to me. I'm I mean, suspe- I I'm suspecting they don't think they're good enough. I, I'm suspecting that some of these younger guys have come in, and uh, or or some of the guys that were on the bench before that decided they want to play. Yeah. You know, it's all about healthy competition, I think, and I think mm-hmm. that uh, I think they're going to get the best people on the field that they think is going to win the ball. You know, if you drop the football, I don't care if you run the greatest route in the world. If you can't catch football, then you're not going to be out there. And the same thing goes with 
it doesn't matter if you can catch everything. If you can't run the route, you're not going to be out there because it's going you're going to set your quarterback up. I don't think it has anything to do with it except for they think there's other people better. Mm. Well, you know, Dover, I'm looking for some scandalous stuff, and you always come with common sense. What is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know. This was a it was a good win for the frogs. It was a win that they absolutely needed. Um, special teams, we won that battle. Uh, Texas lost uh, lost it because they missed a field goal. They they kicked a short field goal and it just wasn't enough to get through. And uh, TCU ends up winning this game twenty four to seven. It was a great win, good comeback after that Iowa State loss. And we are you know eyes up, keep climbing. We're looking forward to Norman, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Um, but just to kind of get going, let's let's uh, go with the play of the game. And play of the game this week, again, is sponsored by Emma Letty's in the Fort Worth Stockyards. And if uh, you need a good pair of boots, go down to the Stockyards, go check out Emma Letty's, or check them out on, online at letty's.com. That's L-E-D-D-Y-S dot com. That's Emma Letty's. And here are the plays of the game. Uh, we have five of them to go over today. So we have uh, Hill to Diars, the play we were just talking about a little while ago, where Diars tattoos the safety. Uh, we have Hicks's two touchdowns. It's kind of hard to pick which one. He had a hard running one from uh, one yard out, and another one for 14 yards out. Anderson with that 31 yard dagger to the heart of Texas. Uh, we had back to back sacks by Banagoo, and uh, also given a, a sack to Summers right up the middle that was just electric and ended a uh, Texas threat there in the middle of the game. So those are the play of the games, and we'll start with Ryan. Ryan, what is your play of the game? Well, I usually base my play of the game on my reaction. And so the one that made me react the most, I love Van Gogh's sacks. I, those were going to be mine, but um, Anderson, the end of the game, that last touchdown was just, it was amazing. I went crazy. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right Wes your turn play the game you know well they're all good um but I'm going to go on the one I just talked about that who's your daddy moment by John D'Ars when he flattened that <laughs> Texas player <laughs> you got a little man crush on D'Ars don't you oh I'll tell you what, I like that guy I like him a lot <laughs> all right Hunter you're up next uh I'm also with Ryan I wanted to go with the Ben Sachs and I would have you know if, if we win 17-7 I'm going with the Ben Benigou Sachs but then just the ankle break going on with Darius Anderson, I've got to go with him. That was an amazing run. Uh, you know, he made a really good safety look silly. <laughs> <laughs> Dubber. I am actually going with the Banagoo sacks because I felt like at that point in time, they were, they were moving the ball. We needed a stop. And not only did we get it, we got it twice in a row when I thought they were had. They had a little momentum going, and if we couldn't have stopped them then, and they would have drove down and scored, who knows? It might have been a different game. I don't, I don't think it would have, but I think that was almost one of the one of the plays that that second sack, especially, kind of put the nail in the coffin as far as their offense. Yeah, I, I'm going to agree with Dubber there. Yeah, I'm going to go with the sacks with Banigou, and there, there was a couple of really good photos from this game, but there was one that had. Um, that was caught of Banigou, who was just absolutely about ready just to take down Bouchelle. And Bouchelle had this look on his face like, oh, crap. And it was, and he had a couple of those. He also had one, I think, Traven Howard. There was a shot of Traven Howard coming after him. He also had just like this deer in a headlight kind of a look. But it, it was it was Banigou's sacks first that kind of set up that later in the game. And yep. he, if he didn't have those two back-to-back -back sacks, I, who knows what, like Dubber said, who knows what would happen on that drive. But that set up the fact that Bouchelle was just looking over his shoulder the entire rest of the game, and that was that was for me that was the that was the setup. And but yeah, Hunter, uh, that uh, that little juke move that he Anderson made there on that safety that that's something that I can just have as like an animated gif just playing over and over and over again. It was fantastic to watch. Yeah, if we don't have one of those yet, I think we need to make one because that was just awesome. <laughs> Should I have like like the caption? Oh snap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yep. As in your ankles. Yes, uh, exactly. Whatever. Yeah. All right, well, that Cause. that takes it to the uh, play of the game. And uh, normally we go over the, the scores of the Big 12. And and really, I'm only going to focus on, on two scores today because we got to move on because we had Coach on. And uh, the first score is going to be Bedlam. And this one set up the game for this week. Oklahoma goes into Oklahoma State, a game all of us were, I guess, were hoping that Oklahoma State would win. Um, a couple of us did pick Oklahoma last week. 
But Oklahoma comes away with a 10-point win, 62-52, to and, and that final score is a little skewed because they scored uh, on a touchdown a little bit late in a kind of a uh, broken-down play. But uh, what did you guys think about this this particular outcome? Do you think that this was good for TCU, or do you think that you would rather have seen Oklahoma State beat Oklahoma before we went up to Norman? Well, let me just say this. I was totally wrong. How so? Oklahoma State lost their defense. (laughs) Oh, yeah. No, I I was wrong with you, too. Totally, totally 100% wrong. You know what? Looking at it, I don't think there's – I don't think it hurts or helps. I mean, it. I mean, one way or another, we're going to have to play Oklahoma this week, and so that's going to be a whole different deal, and that's going to shine light on us, or you know, or, or not. I mean, and so as far as who won the game, I don't, I don't, I don't think it really was that huge of an outcome, except for for the nation and everything. I guess it makes it a lot bigger game for us this weekend, you know. But uh, I was a little surprised. I thought there would be at least a little bit of defense played, but there really wasn't. You know, you stepped all over my brilliant joke. I don't see. I love watching a good defensive battle like that. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there was no no defense. I, I mean, how many yards were there? Thirteen hundred yards or something like that, or twelve hundred? Something. I stupid. mean, it was. Yeah, it was over thirteen hundred yards it, total it, offense. I mean, Mayfield had five hundred ninety-eight yards passing. I mean, my gosh. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's good, but he ain't that good. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, it was it was crazy game, and nobody had defense that day. Well, Oklahoma really hasn't had much of a defense all year long, and mm-hmm. I think that bodes well for next week, which we'll get into in just a minute. But uh, the other game that I do want to talk about is, uh, unfortunately, bearer of bad news. Karma finally lost. Baylor wins 38-9 to against Kansas. Sorry, guys. Yeah, RIP. Uh, let's just move on. Yep. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that being said, let's talk a little bit about the upcoming game this week. And uh, But, you know, there's some of these Baylor fans sitting back going, oh, yeah, we're back. Yeah. We, we beat Baylor's we're back, baby. <laughs> Baylor's back. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. no, hey, you're, you're... that's fine. I'm sure. I'm sure they are delusional. But, oh my uh, gosh, y'all know, but let's just hope our players aren't as aren't like us and that they're actually taken <laughs> seriously. <laughs> well, you know, as I drove through Waco yesterday, last night, their their stadium was glowing green. Barf. And I, oh, uh, good God. Like, yeah, at least it's done at home. That's good. <sighs> yeah, you saw that toilet bowl stadium running sewage out in the Brazos <laughs> River. It's like what it was. <laughs> you, you, there, there's so much junk in the Brazos, you couldn't dye it green. It's 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 no. not like Chicago. You couldn't do that with the Brazos. No, it glows green, but you don't know what it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's iridescent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It makes the bodies floating by show up better, though. Ooh. <laughs> All right, well... <clears throat> let's uh, let's move on. And uh, TCU is going to play Oklahoma in what will be a top, what we're assuming is probably going to be either five versus six or four versus six after the, the uh, college football playoff rankings come out later this week. Uh, it will be a nationally televised game. I, I'm assuming it's probably also going to be another game day uh, stop this week. If not, I don't know what other game is going to be bigger in the country. But TCU versus Oklahoma up in Norman – Let's talk about this game real quick. We just talked about uh, the defense. Let's talk first off Baker Mayfield and the TCU defense. I, I think this is going to be the the, the storyline that we're going to hear all week long. Oklahoma's vaunted offense versus TCU's top defense. What do you guys think about this matchup? Uh, I think you're exactly right. But unlike Texas, Oklahoma does have an offensive line, so we need to be – you know, we need to bring some good, strong defensive pressure, but they're, you know, they're going to be ready for it. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm going to tell you, this this is going to be a good game. I mean, uh, you can like Baker Mayfield or not. It don't really matter. Not. I mean, <laughs> but there's there's no denying he's a competitor. And he he he's good at, at willing wins and, and uh, 
he's got them guys thinking that, you know, he's Superman, you know, as far as the rest of his players, he, he does, he, he does a great job. I mean, you know, I mean, some of the stuff he does off the field and after the games, you want to grab him and shake him or hang him or whatever you want to say. But <laughs> as far as being on the field, there's no doubt. He's, you know, it's going to be a good matchup for our defense. You're right. Maybe, maybe Patterson will invite members of the uh, Little Rock Police Force to be his guest on the sideline during this game. Yeah, maybe like the honorary captains for the game. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We totally should have made a shirt. Dang it. We that Little Rock PD. Yeah, that would have been great. Um, all in purple, arresting Little Baker Mayfield since since 2017. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> no, I, I, ugh. I, I'm gonna have to start putting like a Little Rock PD counter like on the podcast every time it's mentioned next week. That'll be uh... Uh, ah. yeah. I, that's definitely. I really, I really am more interested to see if it's our offense that shows up or their defense shows up. Because that's mm-hmm. going to be the telltale of the game right there. Now, you yeah. know, there's factors on these both sides. I mean, if, we, if we're if we shutting down Baker, you know, I mean, if we're shutting their, their deep offense down, then, you know, it gives us more opportunities for our offense. But really and truly, I think that's going to be like a heavyweight fight between our defense and our offense. And it really depends on how our offense shows up. If they – I agree with Hunter, and I agree with all y'all. I think we've all said the same thing. I don't think we can get away with playing ultra conservative unless we get a lead. You know, now I will say that if he's got him scheme, but it, it, it I, better be a big lead. Hey, yeah. it, it can't be ten points. Can't be ten. The, hey, the efficiency of our offense is going to be crucial. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, do we have um, is Porter back next week? Do we know? Morris? Who? Morris? The center? Morris. Yeah, yeah. Chad Morris. Morris. Yeah. Morris. Sorry, I thought you said Porter. We need him back. <clears throat> yeah, we need him back in a big we, way. We, we need him back. If he comes back and – and uh, I always – I can't never pronounce the kid's name. The center moves Schlottman. back to guard. Yeah, well, yeah. If he moves back to guard and, and we get Morris back, boy, that that help a whole bunch. Now, when I say – Efficiency. I don't know if I'm totally with with. I mean, y'all might think I'm a little crazy, but I still think we got to have the game plan, kind of like we had against Oklahoma State. Yep. Mm-hmm. I mean, our best offense is taking Anderson Them off the picks field. and running. If, if we're efficient and running the ball, yep. If Baker's not on the field, he can't score. And the longer we can keep their defense on the floor, the field, the more we wear them down. So that eventually, if it does, we come into a score fest. So you know, it's an easier deal for us in the in the long run. Definitely, yeah. And th- this is going to be probably one of the worst defenses we've faced, statistically speaking, uh, in several yep. weeks. So yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I think we just take cues from what Oklahoma State, what we did against Oklahoma State. Uh, look to see what Oklahoma did against Oklahoma State last week, and and also take cues off of what Iowa State did and. I think if we just do the same game plan we did against Oklahoma State, like you said, Dubber, I, I think we have to have time of possession. We have to hold on to the ball. We can't have stupid mistakes. And we just gotta we just gotta trust in the fact that the run will eventually in the first half, the run of the first half will open things up in the second half. And yep. don't try to panic if we're not scoring in the first half. Just as long as we just yep. stick to that game plan. And th- this is one of them games you might as well know. They're gonna make some plays, especially offensively. Oh yeah, I mean, big that, plays. That's just, that's just gonna be. That's just one of the things. They're gonna make some plays, and you know we just you know, but we're gonna make some plays. I believe that too, uh, and you know so. I think it's gonna be a great ball game. I think it's gonna be a close ball game. I, you know, the last two years, you know they've been we, one of them was high score and one of them wasn't as high score, but they were both close. I mean, we 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 play close games with them. We all, I mean, uh, that's why the first year I said I'm almost more scared of going to Oklahoma State than I am Oklahoma. Because, mm-hmm. you know, for some reason, we go to Oklahoma, we play pretty good. We, I mean, even before Big 12, I mean, you know, we played up there a couple – we always – we just feel – I don't know if we feel comfortable there or whatever, but we 
we played pretty good there. Well, even the 2013 game, yeah, the, the first year where we had Boykin kind of thrown in the middle of the season, uh, we almost won that game. Yep. And it yep. was it's defense always keeps us in the game. And if if offense could show up, there's nothing that you could do to stop TCU because if the offense yep. shows up, forget about it because Patterson's good enough of a coach, he's going to turn the screws on you eventually, and you're gonna you're not going to be able to score as much as you hope you're going to be able to score. And uh, that's got to be a key to the game to me. I mean, you're talking about that heavyweight ba- battle. Because you're right. May- Baker Mayfield, as much as I hate that little prick, he's a good quarterback. <laughs> yep. And, yep. you know, I, and, and he's going to make plays. And he's going to make he's gonna make fantastic plays. He's going to make plays that everyone in the press box on Saturday is going to be like, oh, Heisman, 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 Heisman. Yep. And I'm going to turn to them and I go, shut up. Yeah, but they're going to – it's going to happen. It, yep. You know it's going to happen. But yep. the, the key is, is how many of those series – are the killer bees going to slow down, stop? How many out turnovers are we going to get on defense, if any? What is Patterson going to do to confuse and slow down this offense? And what are we are what are we going to do on offense to keep them off the field? And yep. if we could do all those things, we're going to win. But I agree with you, Dubber. It's going to be a close game. Well, you know, my deal is is it's going to be a big slug fest, right? So I just think the offense. Is, you know, you're. There's no denying they've they've got the best offense in the conference. I think. I mean, they're mm-hmm. with Baker and what they've done. We there's no denying we have the best defense. Yep. All I keep looking back. So then the thing I keep looking at is, all right, our offense is better than their defense. <laughs> I just think that, and I think our yeah. special teams are better than their special teams. We just got to keep that doing the same thing we've been doing all year with that winning formula, you know of, you know, and and this week, you know. It, it, it's going to rely a little bit more on the offense because I think the defense is going to – I think they're going to play good. I, I, they have all year. Our offense needs to do what they should do and be better than their defense. And our special teams need to be better than their special teams. And if we do that, we're going to win the ball game. You know, this game reminds me – these two teams it just popped in my head. It kind of reminds me of the, the children's book, The Turtle and the Rabbit. Or the rabbit and the turtle, whichever way you say that. Tortoise and the um, hare. What did I say it to? <laughs> 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 I could come up with hare, and I was like, "What do they call the turtle? Tortoise? That's it." Um, I love that. I love that story, and I feel like OU with their long ball and Baker Mayfield being so confident and his ego is the rabbit, obviously, and we're like the little engine that could. We're the turtle that just takes it night slow and easy and very steadfast and i think if we can stay on that game plan and not panic um we'll win we'll win in the end so i love that little it's a good analogy thanks i appreciate that oh it is it's fantastic (laughs) and i got two small kids so yeah toward you know fairy tales and fables that's uh (laughs) right up my alley right now yeah yeah it's a good one yeah, no, that's a really, really good analogy. I think uh, tortoise and the hare is a perfect way of going about this because you're right, Baker Mayfield and that offense, like Dubber said, they're the best in in the in the league, and they're probably top ten in the country. And you know, mm-hmm. Baker Mayfield, like I said, it kills me to say it, but yeah, maybe he should be in Heisman talk. I don't think he's, I don't think he's done enough to win, but yeah, he's a great quarterback when when he's there. Sorry, what did you say, Ryan? Heisman had a character factor. Yeah, I, yeah. Really well, you know, they're supposed to. They're supposed to have a character, but then Johnny Manziel won it, and that went right out the window. Yeah. Um, anyway. And it was nominated year two, so yeah. it's crazy. Well, but any event, I, I, I think this is going to be a heavyweight battle, and we'll get to score predictions here in just a few minutes. But before we do that, real quick, Hunter, do you have any recruiting news for us today? I do. Uh, it's not much, and it's not great. Uh, I will say we did have uh, – we had about – we had six guys who were committed to us at least uh, at the game this weekend. Justin Rogers, QB, uh, Darius Davis, corner, Eddie Smith, another corner, Devin Oshawan, a DN, Chase Van Wagoner, a wide receiver, and a Tonza Vonger, uh, safety. Those guys are all committed to us. And also we had a an inside linebacker uh, LSU commit at this game. Uh, his name is Micah Baskerfield, Matt Baskerville. He's a three-star guy. He's only got a couple offers, one of them being TCU. But he is committed to LSU, and he was at the Frog game this weekend. So you got to think he was very impressed with that defense, uh, being a middle linebacker and having nine yards rushing. Uh, 
And some bad news, right now, last week, uh, as most of you have probably heard, Jordan Allen, the JUCO defensive end commit, uh, decommitted from us this week. We are still in his consideration. He just says he wants to go visit other schools. So, you know, it's a big uh, big decision, so wish him the best, but uh, hope he's a frog. Uh, Hunter, what do you think drove that decision? Because he seemed, you know, he made that big show. I mean, honestly, Wes, I, me and Dad were talking about it a little bit, and, uh, you know, he wants to go – he's going to go take five free trips or four other free trips to go, go watch the football. Him. Yeah, he's gonna go be one dime a little bit, but uh, you know the other schools that are that are that are offering him, you, you can't just compare them to TCU's defense. So, you, th- I think he'll he's got a good chance to end up back here. Uh, but I, I think uh, he just wants to go check out check out his other options. You know, really just go take those visits. Well, one of those schools is Arizona State, right? Yes. Uh, so, I mean, that coach may not be there after this year, and Phil Bennett would be going with him. So. Yep, definitely. Yeah, it's kind so, of a party school, though. Yeah, true. And so, exactly. He might be wanting to go have a good time. You know, he gets to go take those visits. But I, I think, ultimately, TCU has a good good shot hey, to get Jordan, him back. If you're listening, remember, TCU is 60% girls. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> and we're ranked number eight. And we allowed nine rushing yards last week. And, and if you can, and our find... starting DNs had three sacks, and we had seven overall in the game. And you play DN, you're a rush end. <laughs> Forget all that. Just go find a video of that circus show that happened in the third yeah. quarter. Just watch that. That's representative yeah. of the TCU co eds. Yeah. They all have snakes around their neck. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. So that was that was a whew, that was an interesting show. I I I, I enjoyed it anyway. <clears throat> enough about that. I liked it. So that's all I've got for recruiting. Well, it's a big decision, you know, for these kids, and, the, and you got to take it seriously. And Definitely. you know, as fans, you got to respect that decision because you know, it shapes their entire life. You look at it. Uh, yeah. he, we were the first big offer he got. He he had, or we were the first. You know, one of the first big offers he got. I think he had three offers when he came into came to TCU. And then he became a four-star recruit on 24-7 and, you know, kind of started blowing up a little bit. So, uh, Darn you know, those he, stars. Yeah, he committed a little – he committed very quickly. Uh, so, it didn't take much time to look at him any other schools. So, maybe that's all it is. He wants to see his other options, but hopefully he realizes TC is the place for him. Yeah. Well, listen, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what's going to be interesting this early signing date. Definitely. Oh, yeah. I mean, because – you know, at times, you know, like a kid like that, maybe maybe he's back out there in the middle again, and all of a sudden somebody – and this is what high school kids and, and JUCOs, I think, but really the high school kids, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of effect. Now, don't get me wrong. There, there's that top tier, you know, that those one percenters, I'll say, and two percenters. They're going to have an offer no matter what. They're going to have an offer no matter what. But there's a whole bunch of them that are going to be out there – you know, filling out all these offers and everything. And what's going to happen is they're going to turn around and go, oh, I want to come to TCU. And TCU's going to have to say, well, Sorry. dude, while you, while, while you were doing that, they, they, you know, this feel, I think yeah. this is going to change the landscape. Yeah. Of, of, and I think it'll take a year or two, but you're going to hear a lot of stories of kids that were, you know, him hauling around and all of a sudden, they're not going to one of them top tier schools or one of the schools they wanted because the scholarships are gone because of the early signing date. Yeah, and I will say, Coach Patterson even mentioned that uh, last week in his press conference and his weekly luncheon. Uh, he had said that they only have twenty three scholarships and they've got twenty one guys committed. Now, only nineteen of those guys are seen on twenty four seven sports, so we'll see exactly how this all shapes up. But we've got a little over six weeks. And uh, a lot of these guys are going to sign early. So, really, yeah, he could be a guy who, if he doesn't pick, you, you might just get left out. TCU is, you know, this defense is uh, pulling in a lot of good press, and it's only going to bring top players in. Is the expectation of these guys sign early that they'll show up in January? I mean, I know that depends I, on whether they can graduate in time. but Not all of them. I don't um, like so either. You know the top recruits will. I, I'm. I mean, we know Justin Rogers, Bryson Jackson. Uh, I. I would say Anthony McKinney is probably coming in early. You know, there will be those guys who come in early who have. That's what they've planned all along. 
but the early signing day is really just you, then you don't have to worry about it. It's not yeah. you know uh, there's there's no you know there's just not that time to wait. I, I can tell you. Uh, I was a lowly ranked recruit, but I didn't get my first offer till a week before. And I was, you know, freaking out about it until like the week of it. And I could not wait to get my name on that dotted line just to be done with it. So uh, it's, you know, that may not be the case with all these guys. Cause as we said, the one percenters, those offers are going to be there, but it's just, it's, it's an exhausting process. And some of them are probably going to be ready to get it over with. And yeah. I'll tell you this, it's going to be interesting. You know, the one percenters, who are the schools that are going to be willing to wait for that one or two or three or four guys that uh, they're all saving a scholarship for? <clears throat> and they're going to have to figure out, all right, where am I really in this this list? Am I number two, one, three, or am I number five in his list? You know, because yep. do, I re- do I really want to save a scholarship for this kid? Then I find out he doesn't, and I could have filled it with a really good player that wanted that, to be there from the outside. Or Rice or now, now that now that really good player's gone, and mm-hmm. now yeah. you know now I'm stuck with a scholarship. Now, I'm going to say you probably can't get it out, but I, I tell you what, it's just going to this is going to change recruiting a lot. Yeah, this yeah. December twentieth signing or this December signing day is going to make things very very interesting, and I honestly can't wait to see it just because uh, I, I think it's great for the schools to be able to get those guys in early, but also uh, just kind of it's it's going to be checking out who goes where and you're going to see that a little bit earlier. So sure. But I think the kids and everybody are going to love it. Cause it's, it's just an exhausting prog. I mean, deal when you got to wait till February, it's just a beat down, especially if you're, if they, you know, cause let me tell you, you can say uh, we have 21 that's committed. Don't think that mother coaches aren't still calling them 21 guys. Exactly. They're still trying, they're still trying to beat them down and change their mind and blah, 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 and this, that. And I mean, and that's just the great thing about the early time, time no, days because a lot of schools are, you know, you're still in football right now. These guys, there's just not as much time. You know, once you get that last, you know, the, in February, that second signing day, those, it, there's a lot of coaches just knocking down people's doors, trying to get to some of these top recruits, switch them. And uh, there's just going to be a lot less of that, I think, which is good. Yeah, I think I, I think you, it's going to be good for everybody. I tell you, the last thing that's going to be extremely interesting is if you are a coach, that, well, let's just say someone. Let's say someone gets fired at the end of the year, right? <laughs> if they don't have somebody hired or if they don't have somebody, what's these kids going to do that have already committed that are ready to sign with – a and M earlier, and yeah. it might not be A and M. It could be a Dutch school. This is going to. I mean, it's a really good thing, but at the same time, it's 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 going to throw recruiting stuff upside down because because then you got to think of how you're going to handle your head coaching job. Yep. And I yeah. think what's really probably going to start happening is if somebody knows that their coach is out, they're going to do it I, early. I think they're going to do it early during yep. the season and go hunting for a head coach before it gets that recruiting, that signing date. Well, yeah, I, I think this is why the, the Coach Sumlin story is, is so important because when that first domino fell, and, and, and it wasn't, let's be honest, it, it's not official, but there's enough smoke here that there's fire. And with that domino falling where it is right now, and they're talking about trying to find somebody who's going to coach the bowl game, with that early signing date coming before the bowl games for the most part, uh, this this is not the way to handle this if you're if you're a And M. But then again, it's filled with Aggies. So what do you expect? <laughs> mm. Dude, I just you know, it opens up some of those commits or A And M that that could be a fit here. Or, exactly. Or any school. I mean, Florida. You know, they let their coach go a couple of games ago. There. Who knows? We've got a look. We've got a few recruits, recruits from uh, Florida. Corey. Well, Bell, but but the Florida coach is it's official. He's going to be gone. Oh, he's he gone. Absolutely. With A&M, it's all conjecture and rumor. Yeah. and We may end up here. You right. don't know. I mean, if I was A&M, knowing this early signing bonus, if when this comes out, I would immediately come out this week and say, yeah, someone's gone. But we've got somebody else who's already come in. Or, or have somebody ready to go. Because if you don't, this is going to just be absolutely detrimental to your recruiting class. Yep. This yeah. December 20th uh, signing day is really going to change the landscape of college football. I mean, coaching searches, recruiting – it, it changes a lot about it and it's going to be really fun to watch yeah. because we get to sit in our, uh, 
I'll say this. We get to sit in our ivory, ivory tower with a 17 year head coach. <laughs> uh, you know, and we don't, we don't care about stars and all that. We have our guys that we want and it's great. So I, I'm good with it because we don't have to worry about all this crap. Yeah, yeah. No, no misconceptions. I'm not trying to actually offer A&M any good advice. By all means, continue to screw up the way that you're doing because it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Go offer $6 million a year to coaches that never won a championship or any significant bowl games. Hey, they're doing a great enough job screwing up football on their own. They don't even need your help, Sean. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. And thank goodness for that. And so yeah. let's move on to this week's Big 12 roundtable. And because we're running a little bit long because we had Coach on, let's just go ahead and just – I'll just run around. You just tell me who do you think is going to win these games. And we're going to go ahead and start off with the early game – and uh, early games, excuse me, and that's going to be Oklahoma State goes up to Ames to play Iowa State. Iowa State came off of a, a big emotional win TCU and then goes up there and actually loses to West Virginia. So this is going to be their first game back home after that loss – Oklahoma State, Iowa State, Wes, who do you have? You know, I, I'm going to go with Oklahoma State. I don't see Iowa State. I think their bubble may have been busted now or burst. So, uh, Oklahoma State's going to have to go out and prove themselves and on defense. They don't need to on offense. But I, I think Oklahoma State's going to win it. All right. Hunter, how about you? Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State. Ryan? Oklahoma State. And Dubber? Oklahoma State. I'm also going to say Oklahoma State. That that would pretty much put TCU and OU in the driver's seat for that late night game for the Big 12 with uh, Iowa State picking up its uh, fourth loss of the year. Uh, the other early game is Texas Tech going into Waco. Baylor hot off of their win against Kansas. Can they make it two in a row against the Red Raiders? Ryan, who do you got, Tech or Baylor? Oh, gosh, Tech. Tech. Wes? Uh, yeah, Tech. I can't. I just. I can't say Baylor. I just can't <laughs> say it. Uh, Hunter, uh, give me Tech. Oh. Karma rebounds this week. <laughs> Dubber, clean sweep. Man, are y'all gonna hate me if I don't oh clean my sweep? Gosh. You're gonna pick Baylor. Somebody turn off his mic. Don't don't yeah, pull a Sean. You don't even don't get pull a Sean. Just right. say it. Don't pull I, a Wait, I'm just thinking about it. Tech but just. Don't, keeps- Tech just keeps getting worse every week. I mean, they just keep getting worse. They're not – I've never seen anybody go backwards so fast. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Okay, everybody can hate me, but I'm going going with Baylor. Oh, Oh my gosh. You're fired. Go go get back on your pommel horse. Yeah. (laughs) Post on Sikkim or something. Hey, I've already told you – never mind. I'm not even going to get in a discussion with y'all anymore. I know. (laughs) Just know you're wrong and we're right here. That's okay. all we're saying. And, and, uh, you know what? I hope y'all prove me wrong. I'm going to have my own I told you so uh, okay. how, section how, next I, week. I, I hope y'all do. I hope y'all. I hope that they prove me wrong. I hope y'all do. Hey, okay. hey, Dubber, got a question for you. Yes. How does it feel being out on that ledge? Yeah. Well, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you next week. Yeah. <laughs> I've been warming it up for you. I know, I know. Uh, hey, well. don't, don't be late to the bus trip. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, we're staying at his house, so you can't leave me. <laughs> Drive separately. Well, I'm yeah. going to pick Tech, so Dubber, you're all by yourself. I'm going to say Texas Tech wins this am. game. I know uh, why. Sorry about that. All right, uh, the afternoon games. We got West Virginia is going to travel to Manhattan to play Kansas State. So, Mountaineers, Wildcats. Wes, who do you have? I'm going to go with the Mountaineers. Mountaineers. All right. Ryan. Yep. West Virginia. Hunter. West Virginia. Dubber. West Virginia. All right. West Virginia. We all agree. I'm going with them as well. West Virginia over Kansas State. Uh, the five o'clock game is hapless Kansas against Texas. Texas is now under 500 after losing to TCU. They're four and five. They're still looking for two wins to become bowl eligible. Will Kansas be one of them, Ryan? No, <laughs> they will not be one of them. You're picking Kansas. No, I mean, wait, I said that backwards. Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I was gonna say, boy, that was that's a pretty bold prediction too. So Sorry you're, about that. You're picking Texas. Um, yeah, I, yes, definitely, definitely. I want what you're drinking. That's what I want. <laughs> I'm just be- bedtime. <laughs> Dubber, how about you? Kansas or Texas? Oh, I'm not that crazy, Texas. <laughs> 
<laughs> Wes? Yeah, I, I, I'm not crazy either. I got to go with Texas. All right. Hunter? Texas. Texas? Yeah, I'm yep. going to say Texas too, although how awesome would it be if Kansas actually beat them two years in a row? <laughs> oh, I'd love it. I'd love it. That would be nice. All right, well, that brings us to the game of the evening, the game of that everybody in the nation is looking forward to, especially the TCU fans, and that's going to be TCU going up to Norman to play Oklahoma. This is the time where we bring out our predictions. So I want score predictions <laughs> in this game, and we'll start with Wes. Excuse me. Sean, can I get this first? Oh, yeah, we, let's go with We Hunter. are not on college game day. Well, okay, we're not on college game day. No, it's uh, – Where the hell are they going is... to? Notre Dame, Miami. So Miami's still not lost a game, but they haven't played anybody. This is their uh, first loss. We'll move ahead of them. It's all done after that. So game. just oh. wanted to get that out there. Notre Dame and Miami. Yeah, it's the first one in Miami in like a decade. So okay. their back to relevance will last one week. That's true. And then, although I don't know, I, I wouldn't mind seeing Notre Dame lose a game. Me yeah, either. Yeah, but I don't want to see Miami stay undefeated at this point. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't want to see that stu- stupid turnover chain they all yeah. wear. <laughs> that is we'll such see. a gaudy piece of jewelry. But yeah, I just wanted to. I, I just looked up the college game day, and it is there, so we will not okay. be having it. Sadly, okay. Balloon burst. Where Where is that game? Is it Miami or is it's it in Miami? South? Okay. Yeah, talk about an empty stadium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right, so. Wes, your score prediction, TCU, Oklahoma, and Norman. TCU 28, Oklahoma 21. Mm. Good prediction. Ryan? TCU 31, Oklahoma 28. Three heart attacks. (laughs) Hopefully not. (laughs) Hunter? TCU 28, OU 24. Really close predictions today. All right, Dubber? TCU, 30, oh, let's see, 31, and uh, 31-28. Hmm. Okay. Well, that will be interesting. 31-28, another, low, another tight game. Uh, this is going to be my going out on a limb prediction for this week. TCU, 42. Oh. OU, 24. I, I hope so. I hope, I hope you're right. Yeah, I hope you're right, Sean. Dude, that'd be a fun game. It would be a fun game. This is why I'm predicting make for, it. <laughs> make, make for a great bus trip. Yeah. Yep. It'll make for a real great bus trip. Yep. I just I, I haven't seen anything out of Oklahoma's defense that makes them think that our that they're going to be able to shut down our offense. If our if our offense shows up, plays mistake free. We're going to run it away, and Baker Mayfield's going to have to score a lot of points. And against our defense, we're going to be able to make him pay unlike any other defense he's faced this year. So that's my prediction. I hope it comes true. Yeah. It'll just be if Patterson decides to let the offense go or if he gets a pretty good lead, if he decides, all right, we're going to go conservative, we're going to run the ball, we're going to keep it away from him, and he – he decides to try to keep it a low-scoring game. I think if it's there, I think Patterson takes the leash off the offense. Because I, I, I don't think does. against Oklahoma, I don't think you can play. If your offense has has the ability to score points on Oklahoma, you make them score points until they get tired. Because I agree. Because you can't run conservative up in Norman. I think he's seen, he's seen that the last two times we've been up there. So. But I hope you're right. I hope we're right, too. And by the way, if you want to come with us and join us on the bus trip up to Norman, Oklahoma, we still have how many tickets left, Ryan? I, I think we're unless we've gotten some orders during this podcast. I We were down to just four, four seats, four seats. Left, so. Yeah. And I'm checking now and I don't see. Well, maybe we had one. I've checked afterwards. But yeah. So by the time I mean, this podcast gets released on Tuesday morning. So by the time you're hearing this. You better jump on it quick if there are any left, because there may only be one or two. So uh, it's a fun trip, folks. You need to take advantage of it. Yeah, it's three hours up, three hours back, but uh, it's a fun trip. RAR is going to be uh, supporting us by giving us some great beer for the trip. So come just for that if you want to. But it's going to be a great game, a uh, great atmosphere, and you get to spend it with a lot of great Horn Frog fans. And that's uh, that's something. And Ryan's making cookies for the whole group. Is that right? Did I hear that? Right? But we are going to have some homemade desserts. Uh, I asked Jennifer to make some of her good stuff. 
I think I might do, I can do some slice and bakes. I um, <laughs> I won't be doing anything from scratch. But, slice yeah. and bake. Oh, God. Go to your <laughs> room. Good. Still good. But, yeah, we'll have lots of good snacks on there. And um, good. good away items, some raffles. It's going to be fun. Are we going to give away any of those tumblers? We are. Ooh. We are. Oh. Yeah. I'll, I'll bring some of the uh, nice. Killer Frogs whiskey glasses yeah, to give away, too, while we're there. See there. Sure. So, yeah. And I, I'll bring one of the Sean giveaway. Oh, I love that. Yeah. There you cool. go. <laughs> See, I'm rep. I'm repping too. I got mine. I got mine. There it is. Yeah, Sean gave me one yesterday, and I'm using it. It's a nice glass, it's isn't pretty it? Pretty sweet, guys. It's awesome. Yeah. For those guys who like whiskey, it's a these. it's a Glen Karen nosing glass. So it's a uh, it's a nice glass. It's got killer frogs on it. It's great engraved. So we got we got some great prizes for this bus trip. So definitely show up. And uh, we're going to be sending out details to everybody probably here in the next day or two as far as yeah. pl- uh, lot that we're leaving from and everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't forget to sign up for Texas Tech, too, as soon as that game time's announced. Those seats will go really fast as well. Yeah, they will. So we got those two bus trips. You can go to killerfrogs.com to sign up today, just killerfrogs.com, and you'll find the bus trips. They're down. Uh, they're in the, the menu at Killer Frogs. you also find it down on the, uh, the right-hand menu as well. So – Sign up for the bus trips. And with that, we are now at the end of the podcast, which means it's time for player or coach of the week. You know how it goes. You pick your player or coach of the week. And uh, we're going to go ahead and start off with Hunter. Hunter, who's your player or coach of the week? Give me Ben Banigou, two sacks and a tackle for loss. Yep. Excellent. Wes, player or coach of the week? I'm going to go with Banigou. No I explanation needed. Well, there you go. I almost, I almost said, no, nah, there's, you know, two, Hunter already said it for me. Two sacks, player. I mean, you know, Banigou. Or we, I could say Batman flying in there, but, you know, I think Banigou. <laughs> Mosin. Yeah, that was that was a good play. All right, Ryan. Banigou. All right. He was going to my. he was, it was a tough between Anderson and Banigou for my play of the game. So, um, Banigou had a lot of good plays and goes to him. Dubber. Yep. Banigou. Well, I would I would love to make it a clean sweep, but I'm going to kind of go away from football on this, and I'm going to go with Coach Bell. And oh, okay. Uh, no. I, I know, I know, I know. He but made us all look bad. That's what he did. Hey, he kept quiet till the end. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, he set that one up well. <laughs> it wasn't purposeful. No, I, I, you hey, know, I, great pick. Great I, pick. I enjoyed watching the women's soccer whenever I got a chance this year. And that, that game against Baylor showed a lot of heart on this team. And it was a fantastic team. The seniors should be very proud of what they've accomplished if they don't make it in the tournament. I'm, I'm with coach though. I think they will make it in a tournament. And I think we're going to, we're going to talk about them again in a future podcast, but uh, coach Bell did a great job with them this season and he deserves as many accolades as possible. So, but uh, my second pick would have been Banigou, too, so there you go. Oh, and, uh, I mean, Sean, we can also look at it this way. It's become so routine beating Texas now, we don't even have to pick a football guy when we play Texas. <laughs> like, it's, hey, Texas is our little whipping boy, all right? Yeah, we beat him again and again No, we, and again, we beat him again, and, again. and then they got one. You know, we had a down year, and then we beat him again and again and That's again. That's what happens when you so. have a three-hour lightning delay in a game. I mean, yeah, anything so. can happen after that. It was a fluke. Yeah. Quote, fluke. RG3. It's a fluke. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the podcast. I want to thank everybody who's listening to us out there. We are available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, pretty much anywhere you can find podcasts. Thanks again to everybody who's gone on to iTunes and given us a five-star rating. Uh, if you are listening to us on iTunes, I just encourage you to go on there and go ahead and give us a five-star rating. That really helps us out. We really do appreciate that. You can also reach us on social media. We are on all the social medias. You can find us at Facebook at facebook.com forward slash killer frogs. We're on Twitter at at killer underscore frogs and also on Instagram at killer underscore frogs. And if you want to see that bosun Batman uh, picture, I posted it up to Instagram earlier today. So that is again, Instagram.com forward slash killer underscore frogs. We got the underscore on Twitter and Instagram. So don't forget that. Uh, Again, thanks for everybody who has joined us on KillerFrogs.com to talk about TCU Athletics. If you're not on KillerFrogs.com with the membership, it is free. Just go to KillerFrogs.com, click on the forum menu up at the top, and then click register. And it's, uh, It's a great place to go ahead and talk about TCU Athletics with a lot of really dedicated fans. And with that, I want to thank everybody again for listening to us tonight. And we're coming to the point of the podcast where we all say... 
Go, Go Frogs. Frogs. That's all she wrote. <laughs> all right.